now Micah Miller trying to spring a pass ahead. Nobody in front of Jack Bailing. Moves on with a blast and scores! Jack Bailing! We aren't giving up on chances, and we just got to bottom line execute. Waits, waits, passes in front. Great save, Pelosi, as she robs a gopher in front of her in that one was number eight, Kip and Keller, on the great A opportunity. For me as a coach, that's the kind of D you're always looking for because uh, they don't grow on trees for sure, and, and he's done a really good job being a captain of a really young team this year. It was a really cool thing to see for them to uh, really appreciate what I've done on and off the ice. To the far half wall, Jack Paling trying to play it into the corner. Now Paling turns, squares his body to the slot, sends it up high toward Jack. And Sean makes his play through. Welcome back to the Den Husky Morning House podcast, fans. It's episode number 33. We have some big news out of the NCAT this week. Also, a broadcaster who covers that same league will be joining us for our Healthy Scratch interview segment. And we have plenty to get to on Center Ice View News and Notes. Joining me is Noah Grant, and I'm Nick Maxson. Noah, it is a Friday night. Our first snowfall was this morning here in the Twin Cities. I was not happy about it. Normally you should be, you know, because hockey's played on frozen water. You need snow to make ice. And, uh, well, it's still too early in my brain, even though at this time we already have at least, what, two weekends of college hockey under our belt. But we'll get to why we will finally get to see some college hockey here later in the show. But I first want to ask you, how's your week been and how's your Friday been? Well, um, it didn't snow here, actually. So we're, we're doing all right. <laughs> I can I can see the contempt in your eyes uh, already. Um, Very much so, yeah. <laughs> you know, I uh, I mean it's cold. It's colder than a bugger here for sure. Um, the wind has really kicked up. Um, tomorrow morning, by the time all of you are listening to this, will it will be over? But it'll be our last day of duck hunting for the season. So it's going to be a bitter one. It's going to be bring out the hot cocoa and hand warmers. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be something else. You know what? My week has been good. I uh, um, I'm doing all right. I uh, Otter, my dog made it through another week. So we we're taking it week by week and he's with us at least through this weekend. So, uh, um, well, hopefully <laughs> really, uh, really excited about that. Um, you know, and like I had a good like week at work, you know, like I, I, so I, like we've talked about before, you know, I kind of work maintenance at a local community college here. Right. I don't get, I make 10 bucks an hour, you know, it's nothing fancy. It's just to pass the time while I take some classes. Um, but it's honestly insane to me how I work this podunky little, job and i am you know really happy at my job really valued in my job you know and like i have fun going to work you know as much as fun as you can can have going to work right um but it's kind of amazes me how i've worked you know some upper tier jobs so to speak and people just treat you like crap and it's like how is it that this job that is so you know not important obviously there's not a whole lot of pressure to it but it's like it's just so refreshing sometimes to like a good work environment for me is so important so i don't know i'm just really thankful for you know some people don't even have jobs during this time and you know i'm just really happy that i have a good boss a good job um you know and a good roof over my head you know actually here uh from what you've told me uh your future job prospects maybe are uh, in the works and going all right for you potentially uh, there's a process, of course, um, but it does appear promising. Now, again, I won't pop the champagne until the uh, pen has been signed on the dotted line, but uh, there are some things in the works to stay within the company, again, that's essentially consolidating. Um, so there's some positivity there, but uh, again, still more work to be done on that front. Uh, speaking of which, Noah, you know, in our opening draw segment here, there's definitely plenty of uh, stuff to get to. What I first want to uh, get to uh, is uh, something new will be starting. It's going to be uh, more free merch for those uh, who watch the HWH here uh, every single week. Can you talk to us through to our fans what uh, we're going to be starting here in the next couple of weeks? Sure. I always like when you, when you get to say we're going to be starting something new here. I, I mean, you've said that probably, you know, eight or nine times now, which is, you know, it's crazy to think about again. I'm not- surprised you remember that, honestly. Like, what, what do you take? Like, honestly, like what, what makes the neurons retain that information for that length of time? Um, well, I'm not allowed to disclose it on this podcast. No, I, I don't okay. know. I, it's called this, Nick. It's Just called- text me. <laughs> <laughs> It's called age, Nick. It's called being 10 years younger. Got it. <laughs> so um, 
Yeah, so we are starting something new. Um, I, I know for a lot of people, you know, we really appreciate it. Like I was just about to mention, you know, we've been doing this for almost nine months now. You know, we wouldn't be here without our great fans. And I know we waited so long to get ready for our apparel giveaway and give away, you know, that merch that's getting ready to go out next week. Um, that we just feel like we want to reward people for, you know, being with us on this journey, you know, while we can. So we're starting something called the double minor giveaway. And the reason it's called a double minor giveaway is because for the first show of every month, we will give away two Huskies warming house t-shirts while sizes and supplies last. We will announce these winners on the show. Um, and the first day that this will be happening will be next month on November 6th. So that'll be the first show that we'll announce it. So, you know, definitely listen, stay tuned. Um, we'll let you know, this is uh, this will be announced on Twitter. Um, I think right now I have it slated for just our Twitter followers. Um, I, we might incorporate Facebook. It's a little bit challenging just the way the list works. Um, but uh, yeah, it, you know what, if you're, if you log on to Twitter and you're nothing but the, the icon of the egg, the iconic egg or whatever, you know, and you have zero followers, um, hit us up, we'll follow you back and you have a chance to win a shirt. I mean, seriously. So uh, um, yeah, Nick, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited to get back to our fans. I know we keep saying that, but you know, there's so many people that have reached out about apparel and I'm just really happy to be able to give it away to people and really kind of like highlight them a little bit on the show. It's almost like a fan fans of the month kind of thing. Um, so Nick, any, any parting words, any thoughts on this? <laughs> what are words? No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I mean, the big drive to 300 was important for us, you know, to, to establish a, a ground game, you could call it, but, uh, we want to definitely want to, um, reward those for who continue to follow us and to follow the episodes and uh I, I think it's just again you know when you can give it away for free and uh you know to support not only for us but you know huskies hockey essentially is why we're here and college hockey in general it's always a good thing so yeah absolutely um yeah we have some good things cooking right now you know with the university and that sort of thing too so we're really excited for what the future holds um it's actually really interesting you mentioned the drive to 300 just to pump our fans tires just a little bit extra it's kind of crazy how it was whatever it was a week and a half ago that we hit barely got to 300 followers and now we're at like 325 right now uh, as of showtime so i mean it's just incredible to me honestly the support you know like minnesota you know especially when it comes to hockey the st cloud area you know i I, I know we say you guys are the best fans in college hockey, but we don't say it to be cliche. You know, it's something that we truly believe and we've truly been able to see, especially over the past couple of months, you know, we've had uh, over 600 listens in the last 30 days of our show. I mean, that's just, it's astounding to think that Nick, what was it? Five months ago, we were lucky to hit 200 on that same mark. So it's just absolutely incredible and uh, excited to keep it rolling. And we might as well do that right now, jumping right into our center ice view news and notes. Just kidding. I lied to you. We, we're going to jump into some trivia, actually, and then center ice view news and notes. Two-line fan trivia giveaway, giving away some sweet merchandise, Huskies warming house hats right now. Two-line fan trivia is your chance to win. Follow the Huskies Warming House podcast on Twitter at Warming House Den. A new question will be asked every week. Be the first to tweet us the correct answer. Winners will be mentioned on the show, as well as a chance for prizes and more. One question, one answer, one winner. It's two line trivia. Nick two line fan trivia and I uh, I don't know if we've ever said this before Nick but we've got a repeat winner <laughs> once again uh, this week yeah I think we we've done that a few times there's there's a couple that are really you know they set alarm clocks now you know so they're they're really into it we love the enthusiasm but uh, who took it home this week here Noah yeah I Tinner Heath is going to be our winner he gets his fourth win of course Brody Falconer is sitting at six wins he's our ultimate winner right now on the leaderboard everyone else has one win but we had a really tight race this week um and of course, Brody Falconer and Tinner Heath, kind of, if you've been paying attention to trivia at all, they kind of alternate back and forth because you can only win, you know, every, once you win, you can't win the next week, but then you're eligible the week after that. Uh, they're using that one to their advantage, to be totally honest with you. Uh, so the question was, in 2011, last week's guest, uh, SDSU Hockey Play-by-Play, -play, otherwise known as Jim Erickson, called his first Minnesota high school state hockey game. In 2015, he went full-time for all 14 contests. The tourney broadcast began in 1956, and one of the first color commentators debuted in March of 1980. 
who was this color analyst? And the hint uh, was to visit Vintage MN Hockey. Nick, uh, I don't know if you got a chance to check out this question. This one stumped a lot of people. We had probably seven or eight responses. Uh, Tinner Heath did win by about 20 seconds. Do you know who this color analyst in March of 1980 is? Was it Lou Nanny? Is not Lou Nanny. A lot of people thought that. Um, this one actually has a St. Cloud connection. And like I said, Tinner Heath won by literally 20 seconds. Uh, Herb Brooks called this game in March of 1980, just days after his Miracle on Ice win. Of course, the Miracle on Ice game that year was February 22nd. And then, of course, the tournament finished on the 24th. Uh, and then, of course, we did have Mark Johnson on our special episode last week. So if you haven't gotten a chance to check it out in the Apparel Road to 300 episode, definitely do that as well. But uh, yeah. I feel good when I ask a question on the show that ends up being a stumper. I don't know. I, I mean, I, it's nice to have easy questions, but um, we had we had a lot of responses, but Tenor Heath is going to take this one home, Nick. Um, does that surprise you a little bit? I mean, kind of knowing... A little bit, yeah. Just knowing who Herb was. I mean, he doesn't come off as, you know, an analyst per se. Not in the sense that, obviously, he knows the game of hockey, but there's those, you know, who can articulate it, you know, for a, a bigger audience better than some others uh that to me i just don't see herb as like the camera type guy you know the guy that wants to be the voice heard around the state of minnesota um so that one does actually surprise me a bit but kind of cool actually to think that herb brooks actually donned the microphone and uh you know gave folks who watching uh, the high school state hockey tournament some of his knowledge and some of his uh, analyses uh, as the games were played yeah, I don't know why, because I don't particularly like like Mike Milbury, but I have this image of a guy like Mike Milbury with kind of that that grouchy demeanor, I guess. I don't know. Not, I don't know if Herb was like grouchy per se, but he, he's a very intense guy, right? You know, you know, I think it'd be it would be maybe akin to maybe putting Bob Motzko, you know, up for the for the NCAA tournament or something like that. I don't know. Um, you know, we've had some cool, you know, cool coverage, you know, over the Minnesota High School State Tournament as well. Gary Thorne did it for a year. And then, of course, Jim Erickson took over the reins as well. Jim does a fantastic job every year with the plethora of color analysts he has. But, uh, yeah, kind of crazy. Also, 1956, that's a long time to be doing some broadcast, Nick. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, how many times have you been to the tournament? I've actually been, from a kid who's from North Dakota, I've actually been five times because apparently – my freshman year in high school, back in 2011-12, we played Hermantown in Thief River Falls for a holiday tournament. And apparently Neil Pionk was on that team who plays for the Winnipeg Jets. I didn't know that. Um, but I've seen the tournament five times, and it's more unbelievable every time. Did you used to go every year when you were a kid? Pretty much. You know, it's one of those tournaments where uh, certain families, and I know even certain dads, like, but you take off, like, an extended weekend for work to go to this. You get a full, you know – tournament pass to go into the games and uh it's you know it's a time to watch hockey and it's it's kind of like that march madness type deal because again it's more youth hockey so there's you know big swings and momentum you have teams that can go up and there's routes and you know there's some big rivalries whether it's you know rural or even some of those you know metro type schools and i, I think no matter who you are unless you live in that certain zip code i think everybody just kind of roots against edina for whatever reason uh but uh, it, it's fun you know it, it's a great time to go out and spend some time with the family some friends and to, to watch some good hockey yeah, I, you know, the one game that sticks out in my mind, um, and of course I was at that game, but it actually kind of ticks me off. It makes me think of it was Hermantown against uh, St. Thomas, and I believe it was Tommy Novak that scored the game winner with six seconds left, and of course he does the big bazooka celebration at center ice. Well, that play, if you ever go back and watch it, starts with a defenseman from Hermantown that's looking to chip the puck out with, I don't know, 15 seconds left or something like that, and he gets, I think, like hooked or slashed. And he can't get the puck out of the zone. Of course, turnover pops right in the middle of the slot, and Novak makes no mistake. Of course, he's in the AHL now. But uh, I, I don't know. That was, you know, the big Hermantown battle, you know, where they couldn't get over the hump and trying to vanquish the mighty St. Thomas. That one really sticks out in my mind. Um, you know, right before we jump into center ice few news and notes, do you have a game that kind of sticks out to you in your mind as being a more iconic game for you? Of course, you and I watched uh, Jim Erickson and the state tournament actually the weekend before COVID hit when we were up in Duluth for the final uh, regular season game for St. Cloud State. So uh, a lot of a lot of interesting memories for the tournament uh, for you and I so far. Yeah, I think mine actually goes back to Apple Valley High School back in the late 90s. I believe it was a five overtime uh, uh, championship game. And if I recall correctly, wasn't it against Edina? Yeah, I'm trying, I'm to, trying to remember if it was, but it, it was, I think, Eric Westrom. I, I was three, so. 
fair enough. That's right. I'm dating myself. But I think it was Eric Westrom and it went on the plane for the Gophers who eventually secured the overtime winner. It was one of the longest uh, championship games in uh, uh, Minnesota State High School history. Um, so that one sticks out because, I mean, I think it grew up to like 2, 3 in the morning before that game was finished. Uh, quite the, uh, That was one that, to me, that sticks out to at least off the top of my head. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll jump into Center SU News and Notes. Of course, my dad did play at Henry Sibley in the late 70s and early 80s back when it was a single class system. I believe they were the seventh or eighth best team in the state and uh, had some tough time, couldn't get out and punch their ticket to the state tournament. But uh, that was back when the the hockey mask looked like football mask. But anyhow, I digress. Uh, We'll jump right into it. A lot of news to get to around the NHL and college hockey in our Center SU News and Notes. And then, of course, after our Healthy Scratch interview segment, Nick and I are going to give – Uh, Some tips and tidbits to some young hockey players, things we wish you would have known, things we wish you would have done differently, and things that happen to work really well for us, although I don't know if there's (laughs) too many of those things, Nick. But anyway, let's jump right into our first segment, Center Ice View News and Notes. Center Ice View News and Notes. Center Ice View provides you with the best coverage of St. Cloud State Huskies hockey from game notes, recaps, photos, and more. Go to centericeview.com. And on Center Ice View News and Notes this week, Noah, plenty of stuff to get to, but the big storyline is that the NCHC hockey is back, baby. So they announced today, finally, that on December 1st, that's when things will be starting. A kind of a different format, Noah, and we had Josh Fenton on the show in, in the summer, essentially trying to you know pick his brain a bit on how they were going to go about doing this. They finally have a plan in place after a few months, and uh, we're definitely excited to have it back. Noah, I want to start with you on some of the technicalities. There's a lot to kind of digest with this, um, so you'll break it down and I'll kind of uh, fill in the blanks and maybe some analyses. There was a conference call this afternoon that Josh Fenton uh, had some really good quotes on as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll work as a team, as they say, Nick, uh, you know, and that's exactly exactly what the NCHC did. Of course, uh, one of the biggest proponents, the Board of Governors, of course, had to vote on this yesterday on uh, Thursday, October 15th, to approve the 26-game conference schedule in two-part format, which will take place in what is called a pod. I don't know what the difference is between a pod and a bubble. Um, Same thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's where it's going to take place. So the NCHC teams have been divided into two divisions based on their geography for the upcoming scheduling purposes. They will be divided into an East and West, uh, essentially division. So the East division consists of Miami, Minnesota, Duluth, St. Cloud state and Western Michigan. That's a heck of a conference right there. And then the West division consists of CC that's Colorado college, Denver, North Dakota, and Omaha. And as you mentioned, Tuesday, December 1st is our start date. And through about a three and a half week period or so, uh, each team will play 10 games and 40 games total will occur um, kind of somewhere in that realm you know, in across those three weeks, I should say. So they'll play, uh, teams will play each of their divisional opponents six times, so 18 games total, and then cross division opponents twice, eight games total, with all cross division games taking place in the pod to alleviate travel. So the second portion of the season, of course, those games that will be coming after New Year's, the second portion of the season will then take place January through March with all the divisional foes playing each other at home and on the road. So the teams will play 16 games, uh, You know, during that second half of the season, eight of them will be on the road, eight of them will be at home. And in addition, teams will have multiple and consistent bye weekends during the travel portion of the season. So there's flexibility in the schedule. You know, if a team happens to come down with something, they have a little bit of flexibility with that sort of thing. Some other quick little notes here, Nick, Uh, the overall medical support and COVID-19 testing for all the student athletes, staff and officials in the pod will be conducted through the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, And some places uh, around finals time will have completed their classes, but others will go to remote learning while they're in the bubble around that time, you know, in early December into finals week. Um, And I thought this was kind of cool. Any academic support needed by these student athletes while in the pod will be provided by the University of Nebraska Omaha staff. So, I mean, it's really cool to see, you know, obviously we love hockey, right? But the NCHC always, you know, taking taking an interest in why the student athletes are called student athletes, right? You know, going to get their degrees and potentially do other things in life if hockey doesn't work out. Of course, all of this will be on NCHC TV. The schedules, rosters, protocols will all be released in the coming weeks. And go to nchchockey.com for more. Nick, a um, lot to break down, a lot of exciting things, a lot of logistical things to really kind of talk about. I know, like you mentioned, Josh Fenton had a lot of thoughts. And, that you know, like we just mentioned with the website, they've really broke it down really nicely for us. But as a fan, um, you know, and even as a player or a staff member on these teams, 
what are you thinking about and looking forward to it, you know, and what are the important points to take away as we move into a deadline where when we finally give away our second double minor giveaway for apparel, we'll have already started hockey. A couple of really important things. Uh, the fans want to know, can we, can we go right? You know, are we going to be allowed at this point? Uh, he didn't uh, on the conference call this afternoon, didn't give us a definitive answer, but it does sound like it won't be so at least as of right now, um, the exact words he was saying was they want a restrictive environment. And again, you know, with essentially Omaha uh, was the way that Nebraska's public uh, coronavirus situation, part of why they chose it. Yes, it was. Uh, the end uh, the N Nebraska uh, Medical Center was also a big part of it as well, because early on before it really started to kind of gain um, you know, kind of transmission in the U.S., uh, Nebraska Omaha and their medical center was, you know, some of the early um, U.S. diplomats coming back from Japan were getting treated there. So there's a lot of information there, a lot of support. Um, so it was kind of a dual mix thing, as Josh Benton claimed, uh, as part of that. Now, what he also mentioned today, too, was they're working with CBS Sports College Hockey. Um, so uh, essentially try to broadcast this and try to reach an audience. Uh, they also did mention, and a question I actually asked Josh as well was, you know, if NCHC TV is maybe the priority uh, medium for watching these games, are they prepared for increased traffic? They said, yes, they've been invested updates and that they shouldn't have a problem with their technical provider as far as, you know, many fans using that platform to enjoy the game. So uh, I know there was a concern on social media early, and I wanted to address that specifically with the commissioner when he said that. You know, um, you know, Nick, I wanted to bring up that point really quick, um, you know, because talking about NCHC TV, and by no means are we trying to bash the NCHC by any means, but I know that there has been some dissent through fans, especially over the past couple of years, on kind of the spotty coverage and the way that the NCHC TV sometimes has been due to regionality due to you know obviously some of these rinks you know they have these big concrete you know dividers that divide the press boxes so it can be hard to get signals out you know there's um people i think especially if they got to take a look at a podcast you know a broadcast anything like that there's a lot that goes into it that you know lets you sit on the couch with your popcorn and a brewski and watch the hockey game right so um it's really encouraging to hear that the NCHC, you know, COVID or not, is able to continually upgrade their their systems because I think there's a lot of people that do use that platform, um, and I think it could be a really great way for the league to really promote their game, obviously. Um, so I guess for me and from a fan perspective, really excited to hear about it, um, but it's kind of like the NHL bubble, right? I really need to see it to believe it, so really excited about that. But when we get to see it to believe it, Nick, we're going to have some college hockey and uh, – uh, that's always a good thing. It is. Uh, one also important note is I did ask Josh Fenton, you know, like the NHL, would there be sort of um, a restricted a movement prior to joining the bubble? Um, he did mention yes. So there, there's not going to be, say, you know, like a week or so. It might be half a week. They still haven't had uh, the details have been fully released yet, but there will be some sort of pre-bubble kind of, uh, I guess you could say, schedule that they want everybody to follow. Obviously, there will be some testing starting around there, so that way teams have some flexibility, one, and to ensure that most student-athletes can participate in this because, again, he mentioned this multiple times throughout the, uh, the conference call that health and safety of the players, the staff, and everybody that will be going into the bubble is his number one priority. Now, as far as student media and media in general, it was also asked uh, to him, would others be allowed to join in the process that is being thought about? They don't know exactly what it's going to look like. They can say if he's the number one concern. He did also mention that teams will have a restricted number of people that could join. So not everybody within the staff would be able to join the bubble. Again, they're trying to, as they mentioned before, a restricted environment. They're trying to control as much as they can. And really, it's twofold, right? Because he says it's to obviously have uh, the conditions good so that way they can play hockey. But the reality of it is, too, you know, there's a lot that he can't control. And he knows, and he mentioned this, too, that, you know, they have to be ready to pivot the season. And he also mentioned that, does that mean they start up and then is it possible they put it on pause? He, it, he admits, yes, it is possible. They have scenarios based on that. They're doing whatever they can to ensure that the season that they are proposing uh, can happen in full. You know, one of the things uh, that actually correlates right with that point, as we mentioned, the second half of the season where you have those 16 final games pushing into the first week of March there, uh, the hope is that you can play in those divisional locations, right? Eight games at home, eight games on the road. And you got to 
you got to think about, first of all, I, I, I have to imagine there's either not going to really be any fans in there or very limited capacity potentially, you know, to think about, you know, probably at least right now until we see where COVID-19 takes us, you know, and then do we talk about fans and you think about if we start to have athletes that get sick, if we start to have complications, well, that's the first thing for me that's getting pulled back right away. Well, if the pod works so well in December, we're going to keep athletes there. We're going to try to do distance learning for a lot of these athletes and give them the academic support that they can need. That might be the next step for the NCHC. Then if they continue to still have problems or if they have problems initially in the pod, well, then maybe everything gets halted. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, you got to kind of feel it out a little bit. It's similar to when we saw the NHL bubble, right? Think about how long it took for them to even get that, you know, put together. And that's a multi-billion dollar industry. So, uh, you know, very, very excited honestly, to hear the news, um, you know, it might mean some changes for our podcast as far as, you know, how everything is scheduled. But uh, yeah, I mean, you got to be amped up with what Josh Fenton and the board of directors in the NCHC has done and uh, wishing nothing but success for that bubble come Tuesday, December 1st. Sure. Uh, I think the last point we need to make and one that I, I think has to be said was they asked, you know, how, when it does get to that, you know, phase two of the season where uh, you're back to everybody's own facilities how will fans be part of that equation? And he mentioned it very specifically. It will be up to each institution, not the NCHC, to decide fans won and if there will be what the levels or capacity might be in. And again, I think that makes the most sense because, again, whether it's in Duluth, in St. Cloud, in North Dakota, everybody's community um, equation is different. Pardon me, I'm having like a puberty moment, I guess, or something like that. Um, but, you know, again, I think it's, I think it's smart. I, I think they're trying, again, to incorporate the fans as much as possible. But, again, safety has always been their number one priority, and I think that's going to take precedence over anything. Yeah, it's going to be, obviously, for some of these venues, it's going to be more of a challenge for others. You know, to be totally honest with you, uh, like you mentioned, I, the biggest challenge right now that I would see out of all the venues in the NCHC, it's North Dakota. You know, you have big capacity, you have a state that has somewhat different restrictions compared to some of the, you know, Minnesota where it has a lot of teams, you know, versus Nebraska, you know, so um, there's a lot of logistical pieces that go into this. Um, it will be really interesting, but you know what, if we can get these teams back in their home venues uh, and get them playing a couple of games and at least have a season, I'm super stoked about it. Speaking of seasons, Nick, uh, and a season that's in the off season right now, getting ready for a potential January start date is the NHL. Of course, a couple of trades in the national hockey league as well as some about four or five big re-signings but let's start with the Minnesota Wild and two names that popped up on the list here Nick uh, they re-signed Jordan Greenway and Capo Kakinen were kind of the two bigger names in that list there of course Jordan Greenway I uh, got a pay bump right here uh, 4.2 million dollars uh, total value for the next two years that's a 2.1 average annual value in his career in 154 games played 20 goals 33 assists 53 points and a minus 10 rating uh, but last season actually had a pretty decent year I don't think people really understood I he struggled in the playoffs but I think you know he was actually trending in the right direction 67 games the Minnesota Wild did play uh, 28 points eight goals 20 assists and a plus two rating uh, Nick you know starting with Jordan Greenway he's a guy where you know he's a big lanky player he's someone who sometimes kind of gives off the impression that he's slow on pucks he's not winning foot races um, you know, when he's having a bad game, he's really struggling. But when he's having a good game, he's a real effective force, especially down below the goal line. Um, I know a lot of fans were kind of like WTF on this one. Why Why are we giving this, this kid this money when he hasn't really uh, ascended to the prospect, um, you know, that we have expected at this point, I guess? I don't know. Um, and the first thought in my mind when I hear that is I think of Mikhail Gramlin and his development process in a similar manner there. Um, Nick, what do you think about this signing? Uh, are you in the Jordan Greenway is young and still, you know, Bill Guerin still believes in him? Or are you in the why the heck is this happening? Why isn't Luke Cunnan still on this hockey team? Neither. <laughs> Actually, well, seriously, neither. Um, last week when we talked about uh, Brayden Holping as to your contract, you said it was a show me contract. This is actually a show me contract. Um, first of all, we can base off of Bill Guerin's own words. Uh, Jordan Greenway said that at their exit interview that he expected more from this player. I do too. Um, to a fan's perspective, does this seem like an overpayment? Yes, it does. What Bill Guerin though was doing, and I think, you know, if there's one thing we know about what he's, I guess his attitude has been with the players is, is this is a really good stake to play. The fans are always going to be behind you. 
but we can't take that for granted. And we have this expectation from you. And if you fall below it, guess what? There's a door and I'm not afraid of trades. The Luke Cunning trade essentially set that tone for Jordan Greenway in a sense. It's not directly related, but if I'm Jordan Greenway and I've got talent, I've got size, my compete level has been questionable at times. And honestly, for me, his skating has also been kind of in question for a guy his size. Um, when I just saw somebody that was a captain of my world junior team get shipped off for someone that's eight years older than he is and is certainly now not going to be maybe as talented, that's going to wake me up a bit. So Bill Guerin is strategically doing this for Jordan Greenway, and it could look like a steal at 2.1 million if he finally puts all the tools together, um, or it's going to look like a, a big bum. The, the issue for Bill Guerin is it's only two years. Uh, number two, it's a very movable piece if you can. There are going to be plenty of teams that will take somebody at six foot six and 240 pounds any single day. So to me, it's, it's, it's a low risk but possibly high reward, and you're not going to be stuck with him for long if he doesn't pan out. But he's definitely trying to put Jordan Green, which I'm going to give you the money, and I'll show me. And I think uh, Jordan Green was going to get that message here if he doesn't perform. You know, you talk about giving him the money too. You think about a guy who he played in every game for the Minnesota Wild, if I'm not 67, you know, I, I'm assuming that's every game or pretty darn close, granted, maybe given a game or two. But you think about a guy who is uh, Jordan Greenway, I guess, predominantly, you could call him a third line forward. I mean, that's just pretty much what you would label him as. Um, 2.1 million average annual value for a third line forward is not, you know, it's not out of out of the realm of being par for the course, right? You know, a guy that you got to think about, you know, 30 points is no, you know, he was gets half a point per game, just under half a point per game as a player, as a third liner, you know, third liners who play, you know, 10, 12 minutes a game, something like that. So, I mean, his production is not bad and he's a guy with a lot of upside and $2 million is not that hefty of a price tag, in my opinion, as, as is what I'm hearing from you as well. Um, and I also got to think, you know, because he's coming off his entry level contract. I'm just, right. He's coming off Correct. his. Correct. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously guys like that, they're going to get a pay raise if they're playing every hockey game. So um, I, I probably would like to have seen him, you know, maybe at the 1.6 to 1.8 million range. I think that would make people feel a little more comfortable with this. Um, but I mean, like you said, it could end up being a steal. You know, he could go out, he could get 45 points next year and, you know, really prove his worth. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and here's the thing, you know, we have to think about, again, we have an expansion draft coming Seattle when if Seattle could take a player, Jordan Greenway is, you know, one of those players you would have to protect. And we all have, you know, talked about the Minnesota wild roster, you know, off the show about the no movement clauses that you have to start there. There's not a whole lot of extra skaters that you can protect. So if you're going to lose a player and, or maybe, you know, put you this way he doesn't perform well and you want somebody to pluck him for you know whatever reason they can pluck him so again it's a low risk contract for me 2.1 million any team I think would take up on that if he's a tradable asset um, after next year but to me uh, I think Bill Guerin is trying to use that as motivation like I'm going to give you a nice pay bump but you got to show me I'm only going to give you two years and if you don't guess what I'll find you a place that will yeah, Billy Guerin making some interesting moves. And you can kind of see he's a man with a plan once again here. Uh, after this next signing here, the Wild now have no one going to arbitration anymore. They did have one player. It was Capo Kakinen, and he was finally re-signed by the Minnesota Wild for two years. Uh, Nick, some really telling things in this contract setup here. Two years at $1.45 million total. That's 725 average annual value. Uh, why is it 725? Because it's going to be split right down the middle. Year one is at 700000 and year two is at 750000 But the interesting note, year one is a two-way contract, meaning that you don't get the same amount of money when you're up with the big club as you do when you're down in the AHL. Year two is guaranteed money, a one-way contract, no matter where he plays. That tells me something, Nick. That tells me that Alex Stalock has a target on his back. That tells me that Cam Talbot is going to have to elevate his game if he wants to stay in Minnesota for the length of that contract or try to be the guy and resurge his career a little bit. And that also tells me that Bill Guerin believes with another year like the AHL goaltender of the year season that Capo Kakinen had last year, that he believes that he might truly be the goaltender of the future. Nick, your thoughts. Uh, I agree with you on most of that. Um, the one way contract also tells me you need waivers also to be sent down, which means as GM, you have decisions to make, right? 
Uh, Cam Talbot, we talked about it. I like the contract. It's a low-risk contract. The money was good because, again, you had other players you had to sign. The Wild finally have done that. And, again, you talk about players who have a target on the back. You're absolutely right. Kak, uh, excuse me. Kakinik can be elevated, but uh, Staylock as well as Cam Talbot, their jobs are not guaranteed at all. Uh, when you have the reigning AHL goal of the year down below you, you can pluck at any time. And, again, his cap, it isn't uh, – crazy the wild had plenty of cap room where if they wanted to bring him up they could um again that first year you have a little bit more flexibility in terms of bringing him up and down without requiring waivers um so to me that tells me that is he thinking about maybe trading alex daylock does that also mean that uh cam talbot could be plucked from the expansion draft minnesota has flexibility here so the contract is designed for flexibility in year one and possibly in year two if things are going well you can elevate him or you can keep him down to me, I think Kakinen gets a shot actually in year two of his contract. And I think this is a really big tell me year for the goaltenders at the big club level uh, here in year one. Yeah, of course. Uh, Cam Talbot's contract, of course, has three years left, provided he doesn't get taken by the Seattle Kraken. 2022-23 uh, would be the last year of his contract. But then next season, 2021-22, would be the last year of Alex Stalock's contract. Alex Stalock currently making 785000 buckos uh, for the Minnesota Wild in both years of his deal this year and next. Uh, moving on to some NHL news, Nick, here before we jump into our Healthy Scratch segment. Uh, a handful of trades here, only one really big one, and then a couple of re-signings. Let's start with the trades here. Uh, the big one, of course, New Jersey gets uh, – Andreas Janssen and the Leafs get Joey Anderson in this deal. Um, Nick, this one was, I, I don't know if it was overly surprising. Um, you know, the Leafs kind of gave up a little bit more of the package to kind of alleviate some cap room a little bit on this one. Joey Anderson, a very fine player coming back for the Toronto Maple Leafs. But uh, uh, Nick, did New Jersey kind of make out like bandits in this one? I'm not quite sure, actually. Um, Adrianus Janssen's a very effective player. Uh, when he was with Toronto, he had uh, some some injuries this season that kept him uh, out of the line for a little bit of time. Um, and to me, he's a very effective depth player. So I think actually both teams kind of gained something on this. New Jersey uh, has kind of almost done a mini, you know, pretty nice rebuild of the roster this offseason. I think New Jersey is kind of an underdog. It's going to surprise some people this offseason. Um, obviously, we've got to see how it all comes together on the ice, but uh, Toronto, again, um, they have to make some tough decisions with a flat cap and uh, for Andreas Johnson, I think they knew that, you know, especially coming into the last year of his deal, he was going to need and uh, probably be offered a pay raise. They weren't able to do it. So you do a trade off to see if you can uh, get a similar talent, uh, for, you know, under your belt for another couple of seasons. Yeah, of course, first year GM Tom Fitzgerald in New Jersey and of course head coach, uh, pretty much journeyman Lindy Ruff at this point, uh, getting ready for a pretty interesting year here, uh, as are the Senators who uh, Eugene Melnick said that within four years, the Senators would be a Stanley Cup contender. Um, boy, he's a funny dude. <laughs> Interest. That's an interesting comment on there. They did have a big signing today, though, that we'll get to as well. But the Senators did pick up Austin Watson, who um, has had some disciplinary problems, of course, uh, with, I believe, was it assault against his girlfriend at some point when he was in Nashville. So um, I don't really know how that one kind of shook out, but definitely interesting, something to be aware of uh, as the Senators do uh, add him into the fold. But a very good fourth line player at that, a very aggressive, very physical guy. Um, and a really good depth piece, to be honest with you, if he keeps everything in check and a fourth round pick in 2021, will be going back to the Nashville Predators. And then the only other trade uh, happening this week, Nick, the Avs got D-man Devin Taves from the New York Islanders for a 2021 second round pick and a 2022 second round pick. Kind of like this pickup for the Avalanche here. A good little return, I would think, with both the second round picks. Um, but those were only, kind of the, only the big three trades, Nick, as we move into NHL re-signings. And let's go back to the centers once again before we get to the big names of signings. The one that I did mention for today, of course, we are recording on Friday. Evgeny Dadnov, uh, 40, formerly of the Florida Panthers, to the Senators for three years, $5 million average annual value. Here's a guy who didn't jump into the National Hockey League until about his age 20. 728 years uh, season a guy who's put up a, a fair number of points Nick uh, and a good producer at that um, I mean what are the senators getting in this guy and how important what is this signal for Ottawa I should say um, who's in a very deep rebuild getting a guy who's really a cornerstone piece potentially for the next uh, three years 
He's a playmaker. Uh, he's a clutch playmaker too. Uh, there was plenty of times in Florida where he was relied upon late in games to try to throw in there, whether it's to tie a game or hold a lead. This guy um, is an offensive fire horse if you give him the uh, the ice time. So I really like this pickup by uh, by Ottawa. Uh, Ottawa's lost some key pieces though too. So you know, for Eugene Mellon to come out there and say that you know they're going to be a cup contender for years. Uh, Ha ha ha! Honestly, um, they uh, you have to spend money to to really be competitive in this league. He has been you know pretty much chastised for being pretty much at the NHL floor for the last uh, couple of seasons. Now, is there a change potentially happening with Pierre Dorian with GM uh, maybe getting some more leeway to spend some money? I don't know. Uh, but again, you throw the right mix of players together, you never know what can happen. But this is a very good. Uh, piece for Ottawa. Does it really signal much for me? No, I don't think we have enough of that answer just yet. I got to see how this team performs in the ice first where we can see what its impact might be. Sure. A lot of young guns that are uh, picking up steam in uh, Senators Nation. One guy that comes to mind for me is uh, Dylan Batherson. Is it Dylan, right? Dylan Batherson. Dylan, yep. Um, pretty pretty darn good hockey player there, of course. Uh, uh, UFA, uh, Anthony Duclair, who had a career best season, is on the market as well. Um, so very, very interesting. Um, jumping into kind of our goaltender talk a little bit here, only two goalies, the big names that we both had mentioned on last week's show signed pretty much right after we had had the show the next day, uh, Corey Crawford and Thomas Grice have signed in New Jersey and Detroit respectively, both two year contracts, 3.9 and 3.6 average annual value respectively. Uh, other goaltenders around the league, uh, some backups, Aaron Dell and Mike Smith all got one year deals of for Toronto and Edmonton, respectively. The Mike Smith signing was kind of interesting to me. Uh, and Corey Schneider, a guy who has really, really struggled uh, in New Jersey, a guy who I still believe has a lot of upside to his game. He's getting a one-year deal with the New York Islanders and getting a chance at resurgence, Nick. Out of these five goaltenders, uh, Crawford and Grice kind of get added to teams that are really poised to go on the up and up, I should say. Uh, any of these signings surprise you or uh, you know, anything stick out to you in your mind? Uh, the Schneider one surprised me a bit uh, because, again, he struggled so mightily. Uh, but, again, what makes him attractive is he's cheap labor right now in a flat cap. So um, what could be damning to a team would be if you have a, an injury problem at your goaltender level, that's the guy you have to throw out. Uh, that could be, uh, you know, could smell some trouble for the franchise. But, you know, he's not a terrible goaltender. He's certainly struggled mightily. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you go to a, a fresh team, you get a fresh clean slate, maybe, you know, you just something clicks for you. So, you know, you, you wish Corey Schneider, you know, all the best, honestly, but, uh, you know, there's a reason why, you know, he's getting the contract that he is. Uh, I don't know if, you know, a surprising signing, but I really like the Crawford signing in New Jersey. Uh, again, Tom Fitzgerald is really putting together a really good team uh, out there in New Jersey, uh, a, a, a team that seems to be defensively focused. And uh, for Corey Crawford, who's won a, a few Stanley Cups to his name, uh, if you get a couple of good pieces in front of him, you get some offense. Uh, New Jersey looks like a team that, uh, to me, might be sort of uh, you know the biggest turnaround story of the year if as long as the NHL plays. And uh, I really, really like that signing New Jersey with uh, with Corey Crawford. He's going to do some really good things for that club. Yeah, of course, the other big name, like we mentioned, Grice in Detroit, meaning Corey Schneider does move over to the Islanders. And then Simeon Varlamov will be the other part of that tandem on Long Island. Uh, the only extension that happened uh, last week in a, in a kind of a surprising fashion, apparently the talks had gone quiet. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a six-year extension for Brendan Gallagher at $6.5 million average annual value. Uh, of course, he's at $375 million for the last year of his contract. And then the big ones, Nick, a very surprising one, Taylor Hall and kind of a um, hoping to get his payday next year by proving himself this year in a one-year $8 million contract with the Buffalo Sabres. Boy, Sabres fans have got to be absolutely ecstatic about that one, both in, in terms of, well, term, and then the fact that the Buffalo Sabres, hey, somebody good came to Buffalo. How about that one? Uh, and you know, uh, guys that didn't come back would be Alex Petrangelo. Uh, he went to the Vegas Golden Knights at seven years, $8.8 million average annual value. His career earnings at this point right now sitting at $52 million. And his daily cap hit, Nick, $70,400 per day. Jeez, must be nice. Ooh. Anyway, the last one on this list as we talk about Alex Petrangelo, a former St. Louis Blue, the St. Louis Blues, the 2019 Stanley Cup champions, look to fill that void in the only other big signing of the week. Tory Krug, at the end of our show last week, had signed with the Blues. Seven years, $6.5 million average annual value was the price tag on that one. Nick, 
let's break it down. Taylor Hall, Alex Petrangelo, Tori Krug, and then I suppose Brendan Gallagher while you're at it. I, I, I got to believe that that Taylor Hall one is the most surprising to you. But uh, out of these four teams, which team really uh, is getting the most bang for their buck, so to speak? Vegas, 100%. Um, Vegas with Petrangelo are getting a good, solid defensive defenseman, a guy that can really complement some of them are offensive defensemen, such as Shea Theodore. Um, I, I really like it. He's a, he's a guy that controls the game, honestly. And that was maybe one thing they had been missing as a defenseman with just his posture and his stance in the defensive zone who can control a game for you. And I really think he's going to really complement uh, uh, that defensive core there. Uh, Tori Krug uh, gives the Blues a little bit of a different element on their blue line that they really haven't had, which is someone who is kind of an offensive specialist. Um, I really like that signing for St. Louis. They kind of struggled at getting uh, offense from the defenseman the last, uh, last season, so he's a good, uh, a good signing there. Now, Taylor Hall uh, going to Buffalo. Was I surprised? Yes. But I'm also not. Uh, there's no question that this signing is opportunistic. And I don't know if in a flat cap area this happens to Buffalo. Honestly, I really don't. But for Jack Eichel, who has been more vocal about his disappointment in management and developing and building a winning team around him, uh, this is no question going to be some really good music to his ears to get a guy like Taylor Hall and Jack Eichel. The problem with Buffalo is, again, you look at their depth, it's still very shallow. Um, this is going to be exciting for Buffalo. Do I think it ends the playoff run? Early prediction? No, I do not. I really don't. You, you know, honestly, I, I got to believe maybe some of the reason too is Taylor Hall might believe that with him and Jack Eichel as that one-two punch right there and not a lot of depth behind him, you realize that, you know, Taylor Hall is going to play big minutes every night. You know, he understands that he's going to be able to be a guy who potentially, you know, let's say we have a full, you know, season next year, 82 games and he plays all of those games and puts up, you know, 75 points, 80 points. You know, there's a guy where now he's going to command big money. Maybe he stays in Buffalo because Buffalo loves him so much and he gets nine and a half million dollars a year. You know, it's, um, it's a really smart move by Taylor Hall provided that quite honestly, he plays well, you know, um, you know, Nick out of out of these teams though, I mean, uh, is there a team that you look at Alex Petrangelo, right? 30 years old, he's going to be 37 when that deal expires. Tori Krug, he's going to be 37, 38. By the time these deals are done, Nick, you're going to be like 85. Which team is potentially going to regret these contracts in the end because of regression? Uh, I mean, obviously the Taylor Hall contract isn't a long one, but out of Alex Petrangelo and Tori Krug, um, who regrets their deal more, do you think, at the end of the day? It might be Petrangelo, and here's why I say that. Vegas likes to play that aggressive style of play, which complements him now because he can still skate. But depending on how his body can handle again, Petrangelo, kind of a more physical defenseman, um, he can still move the puck very well. But again, we know that the Western Conference is more of the bang physical type of brand of hockey. And so for, for Vegas, honestly, uh, to me, that's a contract that looks good now, but over the course of seven years, your body gets beaten as you get down. We're talking about the same thing with Ryan Suter here in Minnesota, right? Um, so at the end of the day, that could be the more high-risk signing. Uh, but you could also kind of say the same thing with Tory Crew. Tory Crew is a guy that kind of plays a little bit of an edge for a guy of his size. And going from the East to the Western Conference, um, again, is he going to take more of a beating? Is that kind of slow his game or change his game because they want to take the physical punishment from other teams? So there's an equal degree of risk there, but just a, kind of in a different scenario too in, in my eyes. Uh, the one player I didn't touch on was Brendan Gallagher. For me, who's been in the Canadian, uh, Canadian media uh, with my time with TSN 690 in Montreal, to me, that whole thing was completely overblown, honestly. I don't think the talks were as bad as they made it out to be. Uh, there's, if there's one thing you got to know about Mark Bergevin is if you play for him and he likes you, he's going to figure it out a way to sign you. Um, maybe there was a rift in numbers or whatnot and somebody maybe walked out of the room, but that, don't, that didn't mean that it was done and over with. I, I truly felt like there was a deal to get done there. They got it done. And to me, uh, there was really no surprises. It's been kind of reported that those two are, are back uh, in mutual harmony there, back up in uh, the Bell Center in Montreal. Yeah, Tory Krug, a guy who's kind of a water bug too, by the way. So it, interesting to see how his style develops being the primo guy with the Blues. One guy that's going to have to watch out for him in practice is definitely Robert Thomas. <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> but moving on to our uh, our exciting moment of the day, shall we say, I, and a very excited guy for that matter, Nick. Uh, ben Holden joins us from CBS Sports. Of course, covered uh, his last game actually, or his last covering of college hockey was actually in St. Cloud before COVID hit. Um, just a guy uh, all around great dude, right? You know, he 
I mean, Nick, what can you, what can you say about Ben? You know him a little bit more than I do because you got to spend some time with him. I mean, he was just a wild eccentric guest and you know, whether or not you're a St. Cloud State fan or not, uh, he's, he's got some pretty fun little quirks that are uh, going to be fun for listeners to uh, um, take a gander at on the show. You know, I think there's one thing you need to know about Ben is, and, and he, you will see that when you know, everybody watches him, is he's a, an incredibly passionate human being. Yep. Um, he loves the game of hockey, um, and it just radiates off of him. It, it, and it's the kind of broadcaster that I try to emulate, honestly, because it, when you're sitting at home, and, and as you mentioned, you're on the couch or whatnot, what a broadcaster to me, it's not just about calling the play and trying to make it creative you're trying to create an atmosphere of excitement that you get at the game at home right so you're trying to bring the energy there's, there's a lot of intangibles that ben brings of some broadcasters just don't have and uh, to me he loves the game he loves being in the booth and, and be able to call sports and uh you know just a fantastic interview he's a wonderful guy uh learned a lot from my time spending uh, uh with him last season uh especially in late february but uh just I think uh, the fans here, whether you, you're a St. Cloud fan, again, this guy covers the entire NCHC, uh, what a treat it was to have him, and I'm sure everybody's going to love the interview we have with him. Yeah, really down-to-earth guy, but uh, for 50 minutes, you can turn it up as we introduce our guest, Ben Holden. With a new guest joining every week, it's a lineup chock full of players, coaches, fans, and more. This week's special guest is The Healthy Scratch. And for this week's Healthy Scratch interview segment, we welcome in CBS College Hockey and College Football play-by-play voice. We have ourselves the NCHC man that I call Ben Holden. Ben, thanks for joining us. Happy to have you on the show with us. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm honored to be with you guys and be the Healthy Scratch. So uh, you know, let's uh, let's have some fun and uh, get some pucks in deep and, and talk hockey. And I have no idea what's coming, so it's better that way. So I'm really excited to do this with you guys. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. The boys are buzzing today for sure. Um, so at 1970 birth year, you are Ben Holden, uh, Lansing, Michigan product. Uh, did you grow up? I mean, were you a Spartans fan? Uh, you know, Michigan Wolverines fan? I mean, what, what was the household dynamic like? Are you a Red Wings fan? What's, what's the breakdown of the hockey world uh, in the Holden household? Well, um, the Red Wings, I am a Red Wings fan. I'll start there. Um, I love Steve Eisenman. He's one of my favorite players to ever play the game. Uh, in every facet, you guys know, man, you guys are hockey guys. So he just did things right. He did them the right way. Um, as far as the first question goes, so I grew up in Holt, which is about five minutes south, depending on where you're at in Lansing. Um, my grandfather was a chemist who dabbled in broadcast as a PA announcer. And I used to go and sit next to him and my buddies were goofing off under the bleachers. Um, that's really where the influence came from. My, my grandfather was a massive Michigan State fan. Uh, my dad was a Michigan fan, I think really to razz my grandpa Foy, my mom, this is my mom's dad. Um, so I'm a Michigan state guy. And the thing that's tough for me is in that regard, guys, is I've made so many friends, whether they're coaches, players, trainers, broadcasters, whatever it is that are on, that are at Michigan and Michigan state. And, uh, I mean, I worked in Lansing anchoring sports and reporting for six years early in my career. And everybody thought I was a Michigan fan. They didn't think I was a Spartan fan. They thought I was too hard on Michigan State. And then I worked uh, doing a lot of radio at WTK in Ann Arbor for a long time. I did a lot of, in a lot of different roles. You know, as we all know, you know, we're hockey guys. You got to just take your role and go with it. And I did that. Um, but down there, they called me Sparty Ben. So I, could, I can't win. So um, I am a Spartan at heart. I uh, love Michigan State. And as a kid, my goal and my dream was that I failed miserably at was to play hockey at Michigan State. Um, I used to get caught stealing hockey sticks, broken ones, some, some not broken, by Ron Mason back in the day. We used to ride our mopeds from Holt. It was about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And uh, so, yeah, I, I really, really, truly wanted to play hockey at Michigan State. Never worked out. Never played past high school. But that's where I stand on that, man. Is there, is there a pivotal moment, like either from your childhood or growing up, you know, for Michigan State hockey that you kind of look forward to? For me, I think the one that would stand out is probably Justin Abdelkader, who just got bought out by the Red Wings in 2008, yeah. national championship. He misses the net, and, you know, you're thinking, there's that golden opportunity. And, of course, he comes back and stays with it. I mean, is that, is that kind of the pivotal moment for you, or are there a couple that you can pick out? 
Uh, that's certainly one, Noah. That was, that was the one in my career of broadcasting. I was very close with that team. Um, and I was really close with abs. Um, but for me as a kid, it was when they, I'm dating myself. I'll be 50 on election night. I was born in 70 when they won the national title in 86. I mean, I was 15 years old. Again, that's, that was a huge influence. It was funny because a guy that I used to work with doing games when I worked locally here in Michigan for Comcast, Lyle Fair, who's the pride of Pilot Mound, Manitoba, by the way. I think the population guy's like 30. Um, he was my partner for, for Michigan State games for Comcast for five years. Um, so that was really – those two things, man, were – you know, those were really for me. I mean, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with that team in 06, 07. That was the first year I did regionals for ESPN. And, and so, lo and behold, I get Michigan State. I get Notre Dame. I'd done both teams about 15 times that year. So I knew both teams incredibly well. Um, made a lot of great relationships like I have with a lot of your guys up there in St. Cloud. And I do really – I pride myself in that. I think it's, a, it's really important as a broadcaster that you have those personal relationships where you can connect with guys, even though I'm old enough to be a lot of their parents now, which makes me feel old, but you're only as old as you feel, right? So um, that's a long answer to a great question, but those would be the two high, high points for me in my, uh, my Michigan State hockey uh, life. Speaking of Michigan State, uh, if for the football fans that are out there, are you on the Kirk Cousins bandwagon when it comes to uh, football? You know, Nick, I didn't cover him. I left Lansing in 04. I mean, Jeff Smoker was there. I don't know if you guys remember Smoke or not, but he was there with Charles Rogers, probably the biggest bust in the history of the NFL, God rest his soul. Um, but you know, I, I like Kirk. I mean, I didn't know him. I didn't cover him, but I just, I support all those guys, you know, and it's, it's different, you know, getting to know guys and, you know, like Robbie Jackson, Newell, guys like that, Jimmy Schultz, Jack Ashan, and the list goes on and on. You know, you, you don't see those guys that much. You guys are around them way more than we are. But they, they give us carte blanche, and we're able to build those relationships and get personal. And for us being national, being neutral, we, we have to have a balance. You know, you guys know this. We have to have as much balance as we can when we're doing a game because we don't want to look like we're homers. And, you know, I've been, I've been a homer. I worked in the American league for a couple seasons, 10 years ago in Cleveland with Colorado's team. And I get it. Um, there's something about being neutral that I really like though, because instead of worrying about who's going to win, I just, I want the best game. I want a game like the one that, that you guys won last year against, uh, or was it two years ago when perfect said the puck going off his skate against Duluth. I mean, I want, I want games that are right down to the wire, you know, and, and, you know, that's what I root for as a broadcaster, but um, you know, relationships, like I said, are really important to me guys. You talk about diversity in your career. And before we jump to, of course, St. Cloud state information, cause I know that that's important for this uh, podcast. Of sure. course, you've been all over the place. So uh, you talk about uh, not being a Homer 2008 Stanley cup final Detroit, Pittsburgh, uh, you know, <laughs> CBS, Big Ten, ESPN, Comcast, football, basketball, soccer, lacrosse, you name it. Uh, and one place, when you mentioned Notre Dame, I practiced both at Notre Dame and at West Point. Um, of course, West Point Tate uh, rank is right outside of where Army football is. Um, it, besides hockey, is there another sport or another kind of broadcast opportunity when you talk about balancing and diversifying yourself that you really look forward to uh, when you're not in full swing watching some college hockey? Um, well, it's tough, man. I mean, I, I'll give you kind of a long answer to that, I guess, Noah. Um, one of the things that my dad, my dad's a carpenter and he's been a carpenter his whole life. And I tell this story to anybody that is willing to talk with me and, and get to know me a little bit and do something like this, which I greatly appreciate. One of the biggest things my dad taught me was to be versatile and, you know, to use that word you mentioned, you know, and, and to be able to do a lot of different things. And, you know, I'm proud of the fact that, I mean, two years ago, I did nine different sports in a calendar year, nine, including one on, on CBS. My only opportunity on CBS at this point in my career was a rugby championship. I had never called rugby ever. <laughs> you take, you right? We're talking about that earlier. You take what you get. And so, you know, I do an arm wrestling show that this year, unfortunately, because of a lot of things in this world, isn't going to happen. Probably. Um, that's something I, I love to do. I just, I just like to do a lot of different things. It keeps me fresh, but you know, hockey is, is at my core and at my heart. 
I'm very proud of the fact that I've done nine seasons or parts of nine seasons of Army in their football program. I take a lot of pride in that. Um, what those men and women do that go there is remarkable. Um, they're giving up at 18 years old. They're giving up basically 10 and in a lot of cases, 11 years of their lives because most of them go to the prep school. So, you know, there's an extra year and then you got to do five active duty. Um, I, I just love sports, man. I just love competition. You know, I just love to watch people compete and, and be a part of that. And, you know, it's just fun for me. It's, it's better than a real job. Like I've said for a long time, guys, and, you know, I'm going to do it until I can't do it anymore. Or they tell me I can't do it. And, uh, you know, that's where I'm at. So I just, I just like being able to do a lot of different things. You know, it keeps me fresh. It keeps my mind going. I'm learning stuff. Um, you know, it just, there's so many things about it that I like. Um, but at my core, I'm a hockey guy, but I like everything I do. I'm very grateful for all the things and opportunities I've had in my career. Really quickly, uh, Nick, sorry to jump on you again right there. Uh, between Army and Navy there, uh, I got to believe that uh, you have a different preference than for who you broadcast for in the Army-Navy game. Can you kind of <laughs> fill us in on that one just uh, real quickly for us? Look, I served two years in the Navy on the USS Kiska from 91 to 93. We were stationed in Concord, California. I was mostly in Oakland, a little bit in the shipyard in San Francisco. Even with that said, I root for Army. I just do. <laughs> it goes back to the, what we were talking about earlier, guys, relationships. And, you know, to have those relationships for, for people to be able to trust you and you be able to trust them. Um, you know, the American Hockey League was a great teacher for me in that because I had the ability to hang out with players and I had the ability to hang out with coaches. In the National Hockey League, it don't work that way um, in most cases. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I clearly root for Army. And uh, the Navy people don't like that. They know I was in the Navy. But when you're there that long, I mean, I'm on, I'm on, I've, I've seen two full classes go through that academy of football players. Think about that. I mean, that's a lot of players. And uh, every single time I go there, guys, I'm amazed. I'm inspired. I'm motivated. I'm encouraged about the young people of our country because we get to talk with these men on the football team every single week. And they are absolutely incredible people. And, I just have so much respect. Look, I don't want to see anybody lose that Army Navy game, but again, I root for Army. There's no, there's no bones about it, man. <laughs> Going into broadcasting, Ben, uh, you talk about having chemistry, right? And you know, you talk about being a college hockey guy. You've been very fortunate to work with a guy that I have a lot of respect for. Love his insights, Dave Starman. Uh, yeah. Talk about your relationship with Dave, how it began, and where you guys are at right now. Well, we just talked about uh, an hour and a half ago, Nick. Um, so. You know, Dave and I, I think I'm the longest partner Dave has had. And for me, I've had a ton too. And he's the longest partner I've had as well in my career. Um, it's, it's very cool. We, uh, we met back in, I want to say it was 2008, uh, back in the CCHA, the old CCHA, um, at one of their media days. And Tom Anastas did an amazing job with those things. And he was great at marketing, as you guys probably know. And I thought he was incredible for the sport. Um, so Dave and I first met there. We kind of met from afar. I mean, I was doing Comcast games. We started doing, he started doing hockey the same year I left local news in Lansing, Michigan to become a play-by-play -play guy as a professional. So uh, we both been at it the same amount of time. So, you know, we saw each other from afar. We never really met until that media day and we spent some time and you know, had a great time. And the next season, CBS offered me some games. Um, they had seen me doing the regional that I was talking about earlier with Michigan State and Notre Dame. And uh, if you remember, Alabama Huntsville took Notre Dame nearly to three overtimes in that game. And a uh, kid from, well, there's a lot of kids that come out of Adina, as we know. But uh, Ryan Thang, I don't know if you guys remember that name or not. Ryan scored the game winner with about two and a half minutes left in the second overtime. And I'd said to my partner, Sean Richland, here's what we got to watch out for, right, Richie? And a minute later, it happened. Again, that goes back to what I was talking to you guys earlier about with the, you know, the, the preparation, the relationships, seeing the team 15 times. So um, Dave and I did a few games that first year. And then um, we were kind of sporadic. Matt McConnell was still doing stuff with us. Matt, he's been with the Coyotes for a few years now and he's had four or five different jobs in the show. And he's a good friend, too, and, and a good support and a guy to lean on at times. And uh and then I was in Cleveland for two years with Colorado's farm team, Lake Erie. They're now Cleveland. 
um, with David Quinn, the Rangers coach. David Oliver was our GM. He's Quinny's assistant now, one of them, along with Jacques Martin. And uh, I got divorced. My son was nine, and I had to make it. I had to make a decision, and it wasn't a very hard decision because of what I just said. Um, and, and I left. I left the American Hockey League, and you know, my goal is still to, to be in the NHL one day. Um, and I was real close there, but you know, I, I had a young son and I wasn't going to let him, you know, that was no way to raise a son basically is the long and short of it for me. So, um, when I came back, Dave and I've been together ever since, um, since I came back in the 11th season and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of me and him and, and Shereen, his wife, who I've known longer than Dave, Shereen used to work in Detroit and we'd see each other a lot at, at Michigan state practices and, and events like that. And, you know, we got a great group and, you know, my job's easy on that show, man. It's so easy guys in this sense that if I'm prepared and I got my names and numbers and pronunciations and what I need to know from coaches and players, I just got to go call a game. I mean, Nick, you were with us there in February. You saw us work together and, you know, it, it's, it's easy, man. It's easy. It's fun. I mean, I do a hundred games a year if I could with those two in, in our group. So it's, it's just a great relationship. You know, we both got kids, raising kids, and, you know, mine's a little bit older. Well, his, his oldest son's the same age, but his younger son, Ryan, uh, is about four years younger. But we're friends. We love the game. We love to talk and, and chew the fat and talk puck, man, like we're doing. So we have – it's great. It's, 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 a, it's just an awesome relationship. I love them all. One of the happiest uh, memories for St. Cloud State fans is actually a time where you actually were with Darren Elliott instead of <laughs> – Dave Starman, uh, a pretty interesting storyline. Of course, we're talking about 2013 and the, and the journey to the Frozen Four. Actually, fun note, that Frozen Four was only the second time in NCAA history that uh, all four teams competing hadn't won a championship, the only other time being 1958. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. St. Cloud State led by uh, Hobie Baker winner Drew LeBlanc and Johnny Brodzinski, who led all NCAA freshmen with 22 goals. And we had him on our show just a couple of weeks ago. But uh, Johnny Hockey. Gotta love it. Uh, the number four seed St. Cloud State Huskies uh, only gave up two goals in that entire Midwest regional. Uh, can you kind of take us through that, you know, for Huskies fans, what it was like to be on the call for those games and how in the world a number four seeded St. Cloud State team totally blew the doors off uh, both their opponents in Miami? Well, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, that was a fun regional. Um, you know, it was the, it was the last year of the CCHA. It was right before everything changed, you know? So I, again, had Miami a ton. I knew their program. I didn't know much about your program. I'm not going to lie at that time about St. Cloud, but I wasn't doing any games there. So well, I, I don't mean when I did the games and maybe before that guys, um, you know, you had LeBlanc, you had uh, Hankinson, you had the legend of Joey Bennick was born there. Um, with, with me calling him ball game, that kind of came later. Um, but man, I didn't know who the hell he was. He had long hair down. He looked like D Snyder from twisted sister, man, you know, and those guys, um, it was, you know, they were just, they were a complete team. They had Farragher and Nat on that team, right? Yeah, that was Farragher. Yeah. They Ryan Farragher and Nat, just a great group. They had, they had a great, Mott's had a great mix on that team. He had those older guys we talked about with LeBlanc and Hankinson and, I know I'm missing some other guys. He had the young guys like Brodzinski and Benick and, you know, and Morley on that team too. I want to say he was on that team, right? Now you're yeah, I think so. I think yeah. he was. Yeah. I think he but was they, too. They just had, they just had a good mix. And that's what I remember about that team. And, you know, again, not knowing a lot about your program, the St. Cloud program, I just knew that it was a small town and it was a close knit community and they had a lot of history. You know, going back to, you know, before Herb came and, you know, did what he did to help expand the sport. Um, I, I, I love towns like that. I love the, the, the teams in our league. They're just, they're, they're close communities. And really St. Cloud is too. I mean, Grand Forks is obviously Duluth, you know, the teams guys, but I just, I admired that about your, about the St. Cloud program because it meant so much to them. And I'll, I'll never forget calling that. They're going to the frozen four for the first time ever. And it was a hell of a group, a great team. I would have loved to have seen them get through, you know, beyond the, the frozen four and the semis. But, uh, you know, I, in Miami, I thought would be a, a more difficult out 
But if I remember right, I want to – was it 4-1 in that game? Did, they, did St. Cloud beat him 4-1? 4-1 four in four one. the tip game. And then, of course, that's coming off of the previous night, a 5-1 to one win against Notre Dame. I mean, that's just yep. – when you're talking yep. college hockey, that's a 28 nothing win in football, right? <laughs> that's a good analogy, Noah. That, yeah, and that's – yeah, that's, that's right. They did. They took care of Notre Dame. And, you know, I think the, the college hockey world after that game, really to go back, that was the game where people were like, whoa, that's a pretty good program. You know, they hadn't done much in a few years um, in terms of getting deep into the tournament like that. So, yeah, that was in, – in Notre Dame is – you know, they've kicked at the can a lot here, even, you know, in the seven years since. You know, if they just haven't gotten over the hump. But, yeah, they had a really good team, really well-coached team by Jeff Jackson. You know, Mike Hastings was, was early on in his career at Minnesota State. Um, you know, and it was, a, it was a great bracket. It really was. It was a lot of fun. And – you know, was, I'm, I'm, I'm still proud of that to be able to say that they've only went to one Frozen Four and not that. I'm just, I'm proud that I did it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, guys. You know, we, we want to talk a little bit about some St. Cloud stories now because there's plenty yeah. of them. Uh, we'll start down the list because uh, actually both you and Dave Starman, too, who we had a chance to talk, had a role in this. And that was when Ryan Paling, again, now current Montreal Canadian, went in the first round. And this is a really good story. I actually heard Dave talk about this one when I was with you back in February. But I want to get your take uh, from uh, when Paling went and I guess what that conversation must have been like between you and now the current uh, Canadian there, uh, Ryan Paling. Well, here's the deal, Nick. So I'm watching the draft. Uh, If my memory serves me correct, Ryan went 25th in that draft, right? First round, you guys probably know. And so I'm watching the draft and I see, I I don't remember who picked in front of the Canadians, but I knew they were picking 25. And right when the right when the pick was made, I texted Dave, grabbed my phone, sent him a text, like you guys are taking paling. That was all I said. That was literally all I said in the text. Crickets. Nothing for about eight minutes, seven to ten minutes, guys. He texts me back, he goes, You're pretty smart, Manny. Sure enough. <laughs> That's basically the story. And uh, it was just funny. Like, I'm like, really, dude, you're going to play me like that, dude? Like, you can't tell me? I get it. He was a scout for the team. But it, it was cool. And we've talked about that a couple times on the air, actually. So, yeah, that was, a, that was a cool time. And, you know, I know Dave put a lot of work into scouting him. And, you know, Mark Bergevin was the guy he had to report to. And, you know, they, they really believed in, in Ryan and, you know, still do. I mean, but that was a cool night. And, uh, You know, I'll never forget that, you know, basically saying, I know you're picking him. And, you know, I had a little inside info, though. We'd seen you guys a lot the previous couple of years. So I knew what was going on. So that's pretty much the deal, guys. Speaking of inside info, a guy that you're also really close with and a a guy that had a pretty good year in the ECHL on a cup of coffee with San Antonio, who is now defunct. It's now the Henderson Silver Knights. Uh, Robbie Jackson off the ice with Robbie J in February (laughs) Uh, Ben, can you kind of fill us in on uh, what it's like to hang out with Mr. 23? Oh, man. Robbie is such a great dude. I mean, his family's awesome. I haven't met his mom much. I met her a couple times, but I've spent some time with his dad and him, and he's a great guy. Um, You know, he's got a heart of gold, as you guys know, and, you know, I think he's going to do some good things when he's done playing. I think he's got a future doing this, whatever he decides to do. Um, But, yeah, he asked me to do that show, and I was like, are you kidding me, dude? I would love to do that. Like, here's the thing, guys. Like, I love to goof around, man. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to be 50, like I said, man, but I act like I'm 15 most of the time. So that's, I think that's a misconception. A lot of people don't know that unless they know me. And Robbie knows me pretty well. Um, we had a blast on that show. I don't know that we even, I don't know that he even asked me a question, guys. I think it was just talking about Tommy Boy and the Golden State Warriors, you know, and whatever he, we just, we went all over the place, man. It was fun. I, I, Robbie's, Robbie's a good guy. And again, you know, that relationship stuff that I talked about earlier and, you know, he's one of hundreds of players, whether it's hockey, football, basketball, lacrosse, whatever, arm wrestling, whatever sport I've done, um, you know, to build that relationship. And he's a great dude. Um, we did a podcast this summer with me and my son did one. Um, and I should have just let Luke do it because they talked about the Warriors for a half an hour. Because uh, my son loves Steph Curry is one of his idols, and I think he's a great guy to look up to uh, personally. But Robbie's a class dude, and I uh, wish him well. I'll be keeping tabs on him and, you know, wish him well once they get going. But we had a blast, man. He was so much fun. He was like a little kid with us. He, and I mean that. Like, he just 
he wanted to know all these things about broadcasting and he had me and Dave and Shereen to pick on and, you know, pick our brains. I mean, and it just, he was always fun, man. He just always made it fun. And man, was he a good player, just such a great player. And, you know, the things he did and put up over a hundred points and, you know, was on some great teams. And, you know, I know those guys will always be, always be bothered by losing, you know, early in the tournament, things like that. But, you know, I think the guy you guys got there now is, you know, he's, not that Bob wasn't, but I, I don't mean it like that. But I think Brett's got him on a good path, and he's a hell of a coach, and and they're going to get there at some point. I, I have confidence in that. Robbie was uh, – I got actually I got to do an exhibition game with Robbie for a women's game two years ago. Uh, very <laughs> smooth as an analyst. And the one thing that Robbie does really well is he, he's just a funny dude, Ben. I remember when Bob left for Minnesota, and we were asking a couple of the players who had just found out about his departure, and someone asked Robbie, you know, who the next coach should be, and his exact response was, well, I think he should be like 6'3", blonde hair, blue eyes, and his, he knew how to pick the right time for like the perfect joke, and that's just Robbie's personality altogether, just a, a funny dude, uh, love Robbie, uh, I, I really do hope the best for him, I think he'll do well uh, as a player as well as when he's not, uh, you know, playing hockey, but I want to go to another uh, funny guy, and that's Patrick Newell, uh, <laughs> Captain Clutch as it was two years ago. This guy had some really, really clutch goals for the for this squad a couple of years ago. But off the ice of me between him, I mean, it was really the bromance between Newell and Robbie Jackson. But Newell itself was a pretty funny dude as well out there, Ben. Yeah, he was. And so um, had a chance to meet his dad. I think it was, well, it would have been two years ago. And Dave and I were, you know, having a little pregame, you know, chat session in the hotel there, the Courtyard Mary out there in St. Cloud. And Met his dad. His dad's a giant. Like, what happened? Like, you're like six foot four, man. So, <laughs> I think you guys would appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure Newell will, too, if he ever hears it. I ask, I ask myself that same question every day, but it's all good. Right. Excuse me. So, so here's a funny one for you. One of, one of my cool moments with him. So, you guys are the St. Claus playing at Nodak. And I mentioned to him that I, I said, man, I said, dude, you realize you haven't had a penalty in like 74 games or whatever it was? Uh-oh. You know, right What's that? Broadcaster's jinx right there. There exactly. it is. I don't know what I'm doing. And, uh, and so he's like, Benny, why you got to go there, man? I go, dude, you got to play with a little more edge, man. Like You got to play a little more, you know, get under guy's skin a little more. I mean, just, you know, grind it a little bit, you know? You're so good at all the offensive stuff, man. Mix that in. I was just trying to help guys, you know, right? So it goes out that night and takes a penalty <laughs> for roughing. And it was a chintzy call at best. But he was always fun, man. He was – he just uh, – he was a jokester, man. I, you know, from what I knew and always had a lot of fun talking to him. And, you know, I'll never, never forget that. And he never let me forget that either. You know, Jack and Sean was that way. He had a really good – Jack had a really good memory. And I used to love talking to him on the bench. You know, he's a smart dude, deep thinker, knew what he was doing. Um, you know, Jimmy Schultz was that way too. You know, I spent a lot of time with him and, you know, those guys are all this great guy, but yeah, that was, that was the story about Newell. I was like, dude, you really have a penalty in like 74 games. Goes out, bam, takes one. Yeah. Patrick Newell, uh, 60 games with the Hartford Wolfpack. Going to be, uh, I shouldn't say reunited him and Johnny Brodzinski have never played together, yeah. getting ready to play, uh, on the same team. And hopefully with the big club, that New York Rangers team is primed and ready for some good things in the future. Another guy who's primed and ready, I would say Ben, uh, Blake Lazat, a guy who had a pretty good breakout year, uh, in Los Angeles. I believe he was the only free agent college hockey signing, uh, to play in opening day from, you know, the college hockey world last year. So, uh, um, kind of what's your relationship with him and, uh, I mean, your experience, a guy who was almost a point-per-game player at St. Cloud, just unbelievable. So here's, here's my first experience with him. So I watched a couple games. It was his freshman year, and Mott's was still there. And I watched a couple games, and I'm like, this 27 is all over the ice <laughs> in every zone. I mean, every zone, this dude is all over it. And Dave finishes, and, you know, our calls are, you know, Dave, me, and Shereen. That's the order we do it in. The analyst needs to get what they need, and I follow up. Shereen gets what she gets, what she needs to get. So all I say to Mots is, I go, who in the hell is 27? <laughs> His response is, you got a pretty good eye, Ben. 
I go, I can have one eye and see how good this guy is. Seriously, I'm not making this stuff up, guys. I, that dude is, he's a gamer, an absolute gamer, man. I, in the games we did, now we're not doing every game. You guys know, and those watching know that, I'm sure. But I never saw that dude have a bad game, ever. I mean, he was a flat-out gamer. I'm not surprised where he's at. That kid has worked his tail off for every single thing he's got, for every single inch of ice he's ever got, for every hit he's made, for every pass he's made, for every goal he scored, for every gap he's filled, whatever it is, man. He, to me, is the epitome of a hockey player. He, I love him. I love him as a player. He's a great dude. Um, he'll play in the league for as long as he can, 10, 12 years, in my opinion. He's got it. And, and if I'm – he, he's, he, you guys know this, he's, those under, he's one of those undersized guys. Well, you better be good at a lot of things because you're not going to make it one in college and you're definitely not going to make it in the National Hockey League. So he, I, t- I, talk about, I would talk about him forever if, if given the chance. Just the, the, the way he motivated his teammates, you could just see it. He'd make a hit or he'd make a pass or he'd score a goal, you know, Playing with Newell and Jackson and all those guys that we've talked about, man. Special guy. You know, small town guy. I love his story. It doesn't get any better. You know? I mean, to me, it just doesn't. He, he, is, a, he is a gamer, man. I, I really, really respect him a lot. And he's a really good human being. He's kind of a, what would you call him? Like a Swiss army knife of sorts? Yeah. I guess it's probably. Personal, the- man. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you've been mentioning uh, Bob Mosco quite a bit on this too, as well as Brett Larson. Do you have any good Bob Mosco, Brett Larson stories? Have you gotten to interact with them much? I mean, Bob Mosco is, we've had him on our show. He's one of our first guests and he's a, I don't know if polarizing is the right word, but Bob Mosco is Bob Mosco and there's just no way around that. So uh, or, uh, not even with St. Cloud State, are, are there any coaches, you know, in the hockey world that have really kind of stood out to you as being just, just a different character? I've got one for you, Andy Murray. <laughs> what do you got, Nick? Go ahead, man. No, that was it. I was just going to say Andy Murray. I mean, uh, oh, I remember uh, for NCHC <laughs> Media Day back last September, it was uh, me with the HP crew we're recording, yeah. and Andy Murray comes in, and uh, he's got this joke, right? And he thinks he's super smart. And he goes, hey, did you all apply for Western Michigan? And we go, no. And he goes, well, that's okay, because you wouldn't have gotten in if you tried. And he just he thought it was the funniest dude in the world. But – he is quite the character. I'll tell you, Andy Murray is a, I would actually would love to sit down and interview him a couple of different times. He's quite the funny dude. And Andy's a great guy. Um, as far as your guys, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, look, I mean, that Mots was always great to me. Um, you know, and, and so is Brett. Um, great guys. I mean, there's nothing. I don't have any like funny kind of things. I'm trying to think of, you know, I was thinking about that earlier because I knew you guys were going to ask me about that. Nothing really funny. I mean, we just have a good time and, you know, they're, they're incredibly helpful um, to us. You know, again, we're not seeing the team every single game. Um, you know, we're watching two, three, sometimes four games, or I go back a lot of times, and I'll watch. If you guys played, you know, Minnesota Duluth a month ago, I'm watching that. I'm not watching. You know, I might watch the second game of the weekend before we got you guys, stuff like that. They're just great guys. I mean, they're just great guys. I ran into Mott's, uh, I want to say, well, it was the first year was at Minnesota. Here's a, here's a little thing I, could, I guess I could share with you. Um, so I'm doing an arm wrestling show, and it's in April. And they come in, and they're doing some meetings at the Big Ten. And all of a sudden, I hear a voice, Benny, Benny. And I turn around, I'm like, and I look, and it's Mott's. And he's in the gopher stuff. And I'm like, what the hell is this? I, I hadn't seen him in it, right? like I know I'm still getting used to it too you know it just it was but I yeah there's nothing really nothing really with either one of those guys They're just good guys you know Lars we have a good time talking with him and you know I guess for me the the one story that I think is pretty cool and you guys have probably heard it but I'll share it for those maybe that haven't was when he was driving from Duluth to St. Cloud and you know this story Nick I think I do, but please, for the listeners who don't know it, please uh, right. fill us in. So, and we told this, you know, the first, it was that game, I believe it was that game I mentioned earlier. I don't know if I mentioned, I might have mentioned it offline, but it was the one when it went to overtime and it went off Perbix's skate. And, you, you know, St. Cloud got the, uh, got the extra point. But anyway, 
so we we did a lot that game obviously with his relationship with Sandlin and, and rightfully so and the 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 funniest part of the story was he's like I'm driving down 35 I'm going down to St. Cloud you know and I'm thinking nobody knows except the people that know and uh and all of a sudden the car pulls up next to him and it's Chris Garner the equipment manager at Duluth and he mouse to him he goes <laughs> I know where you're going. So that was kind of cool. But, you know, I mean, all I can say again, guys, is they're both, they're both pros. They're great men. Um, I got a lot of respect for both of them. And, you know, we have our usual fun and, you know, goof around on the calls here and there, but those are a couple for me. But bottom line is we get in, we talk, we get in deep, we get pucks in deep, man. And we talk hockey with them, man. We have a good time. Uh, ben, looking forward to the upcoming season, there's there's no doubt that the landscape for the everything is completely different. You've called a couple of football games uh, already this season. Moving into uh, the college hockey world, the NCHC still hasn't announced anything. There are some rumors of a, a bubble scenario for the first couple of weeks. Uh, I guess for you as a broadcaster, looking at the landscape that is for college sports, uh, you know, I guess the big question is, is this really going to, you know, feel the same to both you, the fans, the players? I mean, we saw it with the NHL in the bubble, uh, the NBA, NFL is trying to do as normal as they can. We've seen things getting kind of switched. I guess, what what are you expecting if the NCAC does play, which way everybody is so far? Yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be strange. I mean, I've done four games at Army and uh, they have the cadets there. So there's about 4,300 of them. Um, I haven't done a game in a stadium with no fans in it. I I'm not going to lie. I mean, you know, maybe back when I started back in Notre Dame in 2004 when nobody went to their hockey games, but that would be about the closest thing. Uh, and I'm not picking on Notre Dame. It was just the reality back then. They stunk and uh, nobody went to their games. So, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be strange. Um, but I think our country needs sports. I've said that throughout this whole thing. And I've said this too, guys, that – I'm going to get a little patriotic here. We can do this as a country. And there's a lot of us that are doing it. What I mean by doing it is doing the right things. Don't go out and be an idiot. But, you know, we can't control people. Um, you know, it's just, and I've been out there for four weeks. You know, I've been on four, not four full weeks, but I've been on four trips. So I've been on the road 16 days in the last five weeks. Um, I'm pretty spoiled at West Point. We're basically on post. Um, there's not many people around, um, so it's pretty easy to stay away. But some of the things I've seen on planes and heard on planes and seen in airports, we got a long way to go as a country. Um, sorry to go off on this tangent here a little bit, but it's just near and dear to my heart. And um, I guess with all that said, like I said a minute ago, I think we need sports. And, and this can be done if we do it the right way, and I believe, I don't know anything about the plan for the NCHC in terms, you know, the logistics of the plan. I'm not in, I'm not privy to that, but it'll be done right. And I think that our fans need that. I think they need the outlet. Life's hard, man, for a lot of people. You know, it's tough. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, in your 40s, your 30s, your 20s. I mean, I got a 19 year old son and it's challenging. And so I just hope that games will be played. Um, I certainly hope that I'll be doing a lot of games, whatever that means. I don't know right now. Um, and I hope that all of us that are involved and love the sport can, can just get around it and get around it, whether it's doing it like this or watching games online or watching them on TV, whatever that is. I, I just think we need that. Our, 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 it just it's important it really is guys sorry i get a little choked up when i when i talk about that but it just means a lot to me and 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 i just i seen some things that just leads me to the point where i'm like we got a long way to go you know um i mean i said to you nick offline you know the last prior to doing football at army on the 5th of september i hadn't called the game in six months and it was you touched on it with dave and i you know it was the 28th of february and I flew home the 29th and I, I'd heard a few things, you know, like, oh, there's this virus and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I've been flying on planes for a long time. You know, I feel like, and none of us are invincible. Um, but, you know, jokingly, um, you know, I've been living in a Petri dish for a lot of years. So, you know, I feel, 
feel pretty good about that part, but it, that doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, but I guess, you know, my point on this is when I flew home that day after we hung out on the 28th, if you would have told me I would have sat, not sat, but been at home until the 3rd of September, I would have never believed you. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I've, I, I'm a grateful guy, guys. I'm a positive guy. And I'm even, I'm tenfold that now in both, both departments because I'm not going to let this beat me down. And I hope that it doesn't beat other people down, but I know it is beating a lot of people down. And, uh, you know, whether it's mentally, financially, physically, whatever it is, um, you know, I just, you know, I, the first game I did, man, I, I couldn't help but think about all the people that work in our field that, that haven't done it. I mean, I got chills talking about it with you guys. And it's, you just think about them. I mean, there's people I work with at CBS that haven't done a football game yet. So I'm just a grateful guy and I appreciate everything I got. And I just, again, you know, we need college hockey. The players want to play, the coaches want to play. I know those that are making the decisions are going to do the right things. They're going to make sure everyone's as safe as possible. And that's first and foremost, the safety and health. No matter what we're doing in life, um, that's number one. And I, I'm confident in the people that run our league. Um, they're going to do a great job, whatever we do, man. But I'm ready to go, boys. Sorry, I got a little, a little emotional there on you, man. But I just, it just means a lot to me, guys. That's all right. Um, it actually kind of pulls into, so we actually kind of, I, I think I'm excited for this opportunity a little bit because we don't get to talk a little bit about, we love to bring St. Cloud State content to our fans, right? Our last, when you talk about before COVID hit, our last game, Nick and I actually did together. We were watching Scott Perunovic, Hobie Baker winner in Duluth when St. Cloud was playing. And of course, Jack Ashan had come back from injury um, that weekend as well. And then COVID, you know, when they were supposed to be in Western Michigan, um, you know, and this is not to bash St. Cloud State, but you go back to St. Cloud State, and Nick and I just did a report a couple of weeks ago where over 50% of the athletics right now is shut down because of decisions by college players. And I think it's important to hear your words, Ben, and, you know, not just so much because, you know, you work at CBS and, you know, you're our guest and that sort of thing. But I think the people, especially not so much in Nick's age bracket, but in my age bracket. Are, Thanks for clarifying. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I got you both beat. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so important for, it's so important for our generation to really understand the implications of this because it doesn't, for lack of a better term, it doesn't directly affect us as much as it does your age group or Ben's age group, you know? And so I think it's really important for, you know, all of the young listeners and old listeners listening to just realize that, you know, COVID sucks. That's, that's just is the reality, but you know what, this is what we're here for. We're excited to get things back on track, excited to get, have guys like Ben here and uh, you know, rock and roll. So Ben, we've only got a couple more questions for you. I've, I've got two. Nick probably has one in between there. I'm sure. Uh, so let's pretend COVID doesn't exist. Let's have a little bit of fun mental oasis for a second here. Uh, you know, CBS covering CBS covers essentially every, you know, college hockey group in the NCHC at least once per season uh, for, yeah. The, the CBS crew, I mean, how exciting is it to be on the road and be able to cover arguably the best league in college hockey and get to, you know, visit all the venues? I mean, is there a favorite venue that you love to go to besides North Dakota? North Dakota doesn't count just because it's that night. You got to pick a different one, but any favorites you got, Ben? All right, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. And well said by you, Noah. I mean, that, you're, you're right. And I, I just, you know, well said. Um, Western Michigan. <laughs> I love their building. And a lot of people are like, are you insane, Ben? Have you guys been in that booth? It's rocking. It's rocking. Oh. not, but the Lost and Lunatics, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. It, Nick, it's a gondola, and you are literally halfway over the seats that are in the lower bowl. You're, you're basically, if I, had a, if I had probably a 20-foot piece of rope, I could throw it out the booth, and it would drop in the penalty box. <laughs> it's, so it's awesome. like the like the calgary saddle dome almost with their gondola out there and uh the yeah. good uh alberta province there yeah it's uh i did a lot i've done a lot of games in that barn uh going back to the ccha when i again when i started doing play by play in 04 i did a ton of games there um i mean a ton of games and when they were playing michigan michigan state notre dame that place is banging man and 
You know, when the game we had with Duluth last year there was, that was unbelievable, great environment. Um, you know, since I can't count North Dakota, I'd say that one, I would say I really enjoyed Duluth building. Um, that's a good barn. Uh, Miami's fun because I got the balcony. It's got, it's like doing opera. I always joke with David. I'm like, come on, man, let's go out and do opera on the balcony because you're hanging over. It's, it's kind of like Western, but it's only a balcony. So it's not like it's the entire box, you know? Is it, um, it's the special Abraham Lincoln suite is what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. I don't know, man. I love them all, man. I, I would say though, based on the way Noah asked that question and he asked it very well, um, excluding North Dakota, I would say Western Michigan. And I know I'm on a St. Cloud show, so don't kill me. Hey, but. that's that's fair. The Herb Brooks definitely needs some updates. Uh, if you want CBS, maybe send over a couple of little sponsorships and funds for the Herb. We can definitely get that done right away, I think. Yeah, well, I'm going to show you guys something. Can you see that? Can you see yes. What that is? So that's from 1980. That's the original magazine. It was nine years old. So I love coming to the Herb, man. I, I love that place. I, it, it's, it's special every time to look up and you see everything in there. And, you know, it's, it's awesome, man. It's, and I love telling the stories about it when we get the chance, you know, on the air and, you know, talking about it. It's a lot of fun, man. Uh, speaking of fun, Ben, my last question for you this evening, again, thanks for joining us, is, you know, we, we, uh, we had a chance to talk about, you know, some things we did uh, away from the mic. And one of the things we talked about was music choices. And, you know, for, for most hockey guys, you know, especially the locker room band, you want something a little bit energetic. Love You're it. a metalhead. So tell me a little bit about, you know, so tell me a little bit about your favorite bands. And, you know, I know Van Halen maybe wasn't necessarily a metal guy, but, you know, big rock. guitarist. You know, he's a rocker. Tell me about some of the, your favorite rocker guys that you like to listen to uh, on a day off. Um, I mean, I really like Disturbed. I love their music. Um, I, yeah, there you go, Noah. I mean, look, I'm going to put it to you guys this way. And those that are watching that may not be familiar, do yourself a favor. First, listen to Down With A Sickness and then listen to The Sound Of Silence and tell me that is not just a singer, but a, an entire band that you want to talk about range? Yeah. Phenomenal. They should have won a Grammy. How is how is that the same dude? I mean, right? How them? I gotta love them. Are you an Avenged Sevenfold fan? Are you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> love them. I, I like uh, I like them. I like th I like Three Days Grace when when Adam Gautier was a singer. Um, big fan of their music. I don't. It's not the same, man. I don't know if you guys are you guys fans of them or not. Yeah, I mean they're all. Yeah. One, they're kind of one of those bands i think it's like they got some really good stuff and they got some really messed stuff and you got to kind of yeah. sift through a little bit you know yeah i would agree with that i mean some of their stuff's a little sappy but um you know good life that's one of my favorite songs man it's just got a great message um great tune but I, i'm not as big a fan of them as i used to be with, when adam was in the band um you know i do like shine down a lot i like a lot of their tunes i think they're a great band my girlfriend and i saw them uh not this summer obviously but the summer before and they put on a hell of a show in, in, in an outdoor concert here in Detroit. Um, I like them. I mean, I like Ozzy. I like all the old school bands, you know, Ozzy and Iron Maiden. I mean, I wore that album out my senior year of high school in 86 or in 88, uh, the Somewhere in Time album. That's one of their best albums they've ever done. Uh, Dio, I mean, I, I just, I'm a metalhead, man. I just, you know, the first concert I ever went to was Ozzy at the Lansing Civic Center. I was 12. And it was when he had started biting the heads off bats. It was fake, of course, but it was kind of cool. I can't, number one, I can't believe my mom let me go to a concert when I was 12. And number two, I can't believe she let me go to Ozzy. But my parents are only 17 and eight years, 18 years older than me. So, you know, I get it. So, but yeah. Yeah, I remember, uh, what is it? I really like the rendition, Shine Down Simple Man, the remake of West. Yes. Simple Man, and then uh, I think Break by Three Days Grace was always one that was always on the workout playlist for yeah. sure. Yeah, there's another band I didn't mention. They're from the great state of Michigan, as you guys have probably heard me say on the air, and that's Pop Evil. Um, love those guys. Uh, you know, the last tournament we did, that was our the song Legendary. We, I told our producer, I go, we got to go with this. The bosses bought it. That was the theme for the tournament. What a tournament it would have been, guys. Sorry to go there, but I had to, man. What a tournament it would have been this year. Man, you guys were you guys were finding your groove. North Dakota was on fire. Duluth was trying to win three in a row. 
Denver's always in the mix. I mean, man, missed it. Hey, it, it'll be all right. I think uh, when we come back, we'll play some skillet in the background for you. We'll be rock. <laughs> Kill it. So uh, my last question for you here, uh, you know, when, when you think back to all of your broadcasting moments, and I know we kind of touched on this a little bit, you know, with the frozen four, and then of course, you know, getting to cover Michigan state, I, uh, I got to wonder, you know, what was it like covering that Stanley Cup final, especially with Detroit being in the final? And then, again, is that your penultimate broadcasting moment? Uh, is there one to be able to pick out? Or is there just like, holy crap, I get to do this for a living. This is unbelievable. A lot of the last part, Noah. Um, but so I've worked one show game, and it was that game. And I worked with uh, the late, great Dave Strader, who was a mentor of mine and a guy I got to know here in Detroit when I was a producer at Channel 50 when he was when he was doing a lot of the Wings games before he left, and Joe Micheletti. Um, that was awesome. Um, that was awesome. I was, I'm still mad at Max Talbot for tying that game. I really am. And then Sakura wins it in triple overtime because, <clears throat> excuse me, I was booked. I was the ringside guy. So that broadcast, for those that don't know, was broadcast everywhere in the world except Canada and the U.S., so we were the international feed and a lady named Lisa Seltzer who did, and I think still does the Blackhawks. She's directed their games for a long time and she's very good on a flight back from Duluth. I got that gig. Um, Cause she did the women's frozen four. I did that with Angela Ruggiero in 2000, well, it would have been 2008 um, up in Duluth. That was awesome. And uh, so I was booked on games five and game seven. So in game six, Boys, I was rooting against my dudes because I wanted to work game seven, man. I was literally, my front door is eight feet from where I'm at here in my living room, right? I was that far from going on the ice, man, and interviewing the wings. And then Talbot scores with 30 seconds left. Oh. And then they went in Pittsburgh, so I didn't get, get to work that game. So that was pretty awesome, man. I'm not going to lie. I want to I do that again, just be in the league. Um, you know, like I said, Noah, the last part of your question, um, that's probably more true than anything. It's hard to pick. Um, you know, I think probably my first game I did as a true professional play-by-play -play guy. I did a lot of high school stuff. I'm sure you guys have in, in your careers, you know, and, and that's cool because it's where we came from. I don't mean it that way, but um, what I mean is, like, the first game I did as a pro was St. Lawrence at Michigan State for Comcast. Um, I'll never forget that. The first regional I did, um, you know, the first game I did with CBS, you know, putting that blazer on, man, there's, there's something special about it, man. You know, I mean, Hockey Night Canada's got a blazer, you know, TSN, I think, used to have one. Um, NBC used to, ABC used to, but in the States, man, we're the only network that's got that, got that crest on the jacket, man. It's, uh, makes me feel like the Seinfeld episode, the, uh, Friars Club when Jerry wears the jacket with a crest, man. It's like being in Bushwood, man. It's like being in Bushwood Country Club. Like, you're in the club, man. They don't just give those out. So, that was pretty cool, guys. Um, you, know, I, you know, the first game I did at Army. You know, again, I mentioned to you guys earlier my, my admiration, my respect, my, my gratitude to the military. And uh, it's impossible not to be moved there. It's just impossible to not be moved and inspired by being at West Point. When that place is packed, man, I know there's bigger stadiums in college football. I know there's a lot, you know, louder crowds, whatever. But when there's 40,000 in Mikey and they're playing Air Force or, you know, I did Stanford a few years ago when they came in there and, you know, there's, it's special, man. So long-winded answer, but I do talk for a living, as you guys know. But I like the way you said it at the end there, Noah, and that's probably how I'd summarize it. But those are some of the highlights from you guys. You know, the first, the first time Nick and I ever met was actually at a hockey game. It was our first time together, and I'm still trying to forget it to this day. So, <laughs> You guys are good together. I like that. <laughs> well, Ben, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, as being our Healthy Scratch interview for this week. Uh, we'll definitely be seeing you at the rink soon, whether it's in the bubble or not. I'm pretty sure the NCHC will play, and we'll definitely have to do this again. And if not, we'll have to definitely get your, your partner, Dave Starman, on here as well. So we'll, we'll have to hit him up as well. So, Ben, sure. thanks again for joining us, and uh, we definitely appreciate it. Anytime, guys. You guys keep up the great work. You guys are great guys. I'm happy to do anything you guys want to do and, and talk, and I really, I really, truly appreciate you guys having me on. Anytime somebody asks me to do a show or an interview, it means a lot. 
and uh, I'm not that important. I just got a great job and I work with a lot of great people and uh, I'm very fortunate and grateful. So you guys keep rocking on and keep getting pucks in deep, boys. Hashtag pucks deep. Yeah, all day. Boys are buzzing. Uh, thanks again, Ben. Uh, we appreciate it. Hopefully talk to you soon. Thanks, Noah. You guys too. Take the Huskies Warming House podcast wherever you go. Find the newest episodes or listen to your favorite on iTunes and Podbean. Get all the latest news and updates at huskieswarminghousepodcast.com and look for our Facebook page, the Huskies Warming House podcast, as well as our Twitter feed, at Warming House Den. Our Twitter feed will host trivia updates and questions for fans, as well as a mailbag where you can tweet us anytime with your questions, concerns, or listener suggestion. And for business inquiries, email us at huskieswarminghousepodcast at outlook.com. And once again, thank you, Mr. Ben Holden, the voice of CBS Sports College Hockey, for joining us. Just, again, fantastic human being. And I uh, hope to have him on soon again. And uh, more importantly, if the NCHC uh, pod, as they call it, uh, allows CBS to cover some games, I think he's going to be probably the happiest customer of everybody uh, that he'll hopefully be able to go in and uh, let us know how things are going. Yeah, well, uh, pucks in deep. That's all I remember from that. <laughs> So uh, boys, boys are buzzing tonight, ladies and germs. But uh, Nick, we got some interesting topics to get to here. Uh, maybe let's let you intro this a little bit. Uh, we got a little bit of a lighter hearted segment here that goes back to our playing days. Of course, you with sticks and stones and me with sticks and actual hockey pucks. Oh, uh, funny. Nick, what are we talking about today? We're talking, you know, some just advice from guys who have been through the realms, you know, I guess sort of things we wish we would have known when we were younger players. Um, I, no, I kind of want to start with you just because, again, you're just getting out of, you know, your little prime and, you know, uh, your playing days. Uh, I guess if you had some advice from the younger hockey players that watch this, that, you know, want to play at a high competitive level, uh, what would be some of the things you wish you'd learned, uh, maybe younger, maybe some just some things to keep in mind as you're going through your journey as a hockey player? Right. Well, you know, I think as we get older, right, and we understand with more clarity what we want and don't want in life, right? You know, everybody, I think when we go back, um, you know, they want to be a hockey player, right? Nick, you go to your job and you think, gosh, how nice would it be to, you know, get a workout in and be a hockey player for a living, right? I want $70,600 a day, like you mentioned, that would be nice. Yeah, definitely. See, here's the thing though, annually though, if you can make that annually, keep it under 75,000 because then you're in the lower tax bracket. You did 74,999 is all right. But I'm not too worried about taxes at that point, honestly. <laughs> I, you know, a couple of things that really stand out though for me and one of the biggest ones uh, as we talk about, you know, as you get older, you realize what you wish you could have done in life. Well, I think a lot of hockey players, especially at that young age, right, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, especially right now in the world of social media, the world of video games, everything's virtual. You don't, you don't have to get off your butt to go and do things nowadays. Um, you know, that, that creates guys who aren't as much, you know, rink rats. They aren't at the rink all the time. You know, they're not with their buddies on the pond. Um, you know, they're not even in the weight room or that sort of thing. Um, and I think we all have varying degrees of struggling with that, depending on what level of hockey we were. So my advice for young hockey players, besides getting to the rink every day and keep honing your craft, um, like I really struggle going to the weight room. I wasn't really keen on that because, you know, I was willing to work hard on the ice because it, chasing the puck is fun. It's, it's a blast. But you know, when you're not chasing the puck and you have to doing, you know, deadlifts and you're on your third rep and it's your fifth one. And it's like, Holy smokes, I don't want to do this. That stuff is hard, right? Well, what motivates you to be good at something right, Nick, if you go to your job tomorrow and you're the best person at your job, you don't really think about it. But if you go to your job and you're the least effective person in that room, your first thought is, I want to be better. I want to be like that guy. Then I want to be like that guy. So I would encourage young hockey players, especially guys in rural areas. I think of a guy like Nolan Walker that com comes out of Alaska, right? Try to surround yourself as much as you can with hockey players who are way, way better than you. Find competition, find talent, open ice, pickups, whatever it, whatever it is. Find guys who are way, way better than you because what you might find, um, you know, not even relative to your own work ethic is you're going to find that if you want to compete or hang with those guys and those little scrimmages and stuff, your game is going to elevate and you're going to learn to think quicker. You're going to learn what plays are the good plays, what plays are the bad plays because you're playing with people who are so much better than you. Um, you know, unless you're Sidney Crosby, unless you're Connor McDavid, um, 
there's people who are better than you, you know, and, and on some days, Connor McDavid is better than Sidney Crosby and vice versa. So that would be my first advice would be, I, I think people, you have to see what success looks like. You have to have a guy from your town or from your region that goes to the National Hockey League or plays college hockey. Surround yourself with your Easton Brodzinski's, right? Your Brodzinski families and see what that dedication, that drive, because it's like, I know it's hard to get to the National Hockey League, but people don't even understand sometimes how hard it is to play ACHA, NA, Division Three, Division One, AHL, ECHL, not, never mind the National Hockey League. Um, you have to understand what the drive and dedication it takes to get to that level. It doesn't rely on pure skill alone 99% of the time. You have to see what that work ethic looks like. And for me, the start right now is probably to surround yourself with some good hockey players and understand the right way to take care of your body, the right way to eat, and the right way to play the game of hockey. Uh, for me, it's kind of an encompassing point, Noah, but I, I think, honestly, it's one where uh, young hockey players would get a lot of value, and that's just to be a student of the game. And you talk about the physical aspects, right? Uh, you can certainly spend time in your garage stick handling and shooting pucks and all that good jazz. Uh, my parents were more concerned about the marks on the drywall uh, in, the, uh, in the driveway and slash the, uh, the garage than they cared about me shooting pucks. Uh, but on that point, what I should have done is gone somewhere else bring a net, bring my stick, and shot more pucks, right? Um, other thing, you talk about the virtual aspect of it, right? Uh, for me, what I learned a lot as a hockey player is watching film. Um, I watched a lot of NHL. I watched a lot of gopher, yes, I said it, gopher-type plays. And what I would do is I'd break it down. Why was this play successful? Or why was this play broken? Why did it fail? And it's not just drawing up on the broadcast angle right i think uh, you know a lot of hockey players especially high level say they don't like to actually spend time in the press box when they're healthy scratches because it gives you a different viewpoint of the game that's hard to kind of recreate but for me i at least i was able to uh, later on was able to kind of look at where a defenseman was breaking out the puck and see my spot as a winger as a centerman and just kind of close my eyes and really just try to picture what that would look like on the ice you have to be a student of the game and know the mental side of it to be better. Here's a good example. You brought up Sidney Crosby and Connor McDavid. Scouts, coaches, everybody says, why are they so good? Yes, Connor McDavid can you know, skate faster than lightning. Sidney Crosby can you know, stick out of the phone booth. But really what's happening is their brain is two, three, four steps ahead of the players that they're in front of. And so that mental side of the game is really where everything kind of clicks, right? And for me, that's where I developed most as a hockey player was the mental side of it. And, you know, sometimes that stick handling, yes, it helps me buy time, but I'm not stick handling just to get by somebody. I already looked ahead. I see somebody breaking coverage. I'm doing a toe drag to give him a pass so that way he can go off on a two-on-one or maybe a small breakaway. It's that thinking ahead process that, to me, uh, was so helpful. Uh, back to your point, too, and I just want to kind of reiterate it is, you know, uh, you have to let the game sometimes be the teacher, right? And that means pond hockey, you talk to any NHL player, is the best way to hone your skills and your mentality combined, right? You can watch NHL, you can shoot as many pucks as you want, but unless you're in a competitive environment where you're having to try to, you know, stick handle and get around players in tight spaces, using the net as a screen to break out your defensive zone, or look for those passing lanes, the game is the best teacher. And to get that teaching, you have to play, which means here in the great state of Minnesota, line of 10,000 frozen hockey rinks, right? Snow fell today. I'm pissed off about it, but guess what? As a hockey player, that means, hey, the rinks are going to get frozen soon. And that was your best learning opportunity. Uh, some of the guys that uh, I remember that grew up and, and wanted to have better careers than I did, they basically went to school. They went to the Eastview hockey rinks that were 400 yards up, and they were there for eight hours a night. And I thought they were crazy because, yeah, I would go there every now and then. Uh, but you realize that, again, the game is the best teacher. And, again, by having just that pond hockey, you get better skills. You understand the game, the passing lanes, the shooting lanes, all that good jazz. And to me, spending time on the ice was, you know, again, the best way to learn the game. Yeah, definitely. Uh, to, to wrap up the point here, uh, like you mentioned, when you talked about being a student of the game, what I used to do is when I watched gopher games as a young kid, I would look at the roster card for the night, right? You know, if, if you were getting ready, you know, as a youth player, if you were a centerman, pick out the four centermen, figure out what numbers they are on the line chart for whatever team, doesn't really matter who it is. 
and watch them on the TV. Watch what they do. How do they follow the play? You know, how do they integrate? When you talk about pond hockey, right? It's all about learning the numbers game. You know, if you play eight on eight, you got to learn how that number situation works. If you play two on two, you got to understand, you know, so a lot of pond hockey games aren't even, right? A lot of pond hockey games are five on four, four on three, right? You're learning those special team situations subconsciously. So, you know, that's a really pivotal moment. Uh, the other thing that you kind of want to think about as well, obviously, you're going to want to try to get stronger. I mean, that's going to be important. So think about, you know, developing your core. Think about, you know, that that's going to be your most important muscle. I wish I would have done that more as, as a young hockey player. Um, you know, Nick, I, I had another point, too, and I'm trying to think of it as well. I mean, there's so many points that you think about for young hockey players, but First and foremost, like you mentioned, you have to train your brain by getting out and jumping on the ice. Oh, I remember what it was now. Get on the ice as much as you can during hockey season. Jump on the ponds, do whatever it has to be. When summertime rolls around, your late April, early May through around August or so, mm -hmm. put the skates away. Put the skates away, go golf, go play basketball, go hit a baseball, do something active. Like if you're not going to do any of those sports, keep your skates on. But if you're a multi-sport, well, if you're a multi-sport athlete, it's, you think about all these guys in the National Hockey League, there's so many of them, right? Oh yeah, they had a chance to play for the Gophers on a football scholarship, right? Or, oh, look at him, one heck of a baseball player as well, but he decided to stick with hockey, right? You learn all those different hand-eye coordinations. You learn what's called proprioception, which means you understand where your body is relative to the space around you, right? And that's what hockey is. Hockey is you think so much in hockey that you don't think at all. And I know that sounds weird, but hockey, you're thinking all the time by reacting all the time. It's very hard to explain if you've never done that before, but you I can explain it better if you don't mind. Okay. Um, when you do and you think the four steps ahead, it's not thinking it becomes instinctual. And if there's one thing that I remember interviewing Andrew Brunette, um, that big famous goal that took away Patrick Waugh off his playing career. And he literally said, it goes, my instincts took over. He did not mean to do a forehand backhand. He just said, you know what? I just did it. It was just something I just did. And think, so. think about how many times he practiced that play, right? Let's think about Zach Parise all the time. Zach Parise, he does this little drill where he puts four or five pucks on the right post, four or five pucks on the left post, and he grabs one, pulls it across his body, shelf on the other side, forehand and backhand, shelf on the other side. Think about, you know, he does that 20, 30 times he practices it, and then maybe he grabs the puck bucket, flips the puck bucket up, and taps the pucks into the puck bucket, you know, one, two, does 60 pucks and puts them all back in the puck bucket. He might get one opportunity a week in the National Hockey League where he gets a puck right in front of the net. Where do you think it's going? Where mama hides the peanut butter, baby. I mean, that's just, that's just what it is. You know, as a young hockey player, you have to make, you know, repetitions, repetitions become second nature for you so that whatever you see, whatever you process in the game of hockey, your body automatically adjusts to it. Um, I think it's really difficult if you're a young hockey player who's fast. If you're one of the fastest players on the ice, you really have to work even harder to train your brain than someone who is not so much fleet of foot because your body's working too fast for your mind to keep up. And what you want is you want to find a way to flip that. Find a way that your mind is the most effective and most rapidly moving piece on the ice. And then you realize that the puck is the most rapidly moving piece of equipment on the ice. Make the puck do all the work, man. Guys without the puck are the most important pieces in the game of hockey. So if you can learn it on a cerebral level, I don't know if that's a big word for young hockey fans, but learn it with your brain and your body will take care of itself. But repetition, repetition. And last of all, Nick, the most important thing to do as a young hockey player, have fun. Have fun. That's all it is. That's, that's the expert analysis from the Huskies Warming House podcast, Nick. I have one more thing, and that's just, you know, commitment, right? And uh, one of my favorite coaches, his name was uh, Bob Conley uh, for the ECU Athletic Association. And he said, good players will shoot 50 pucks to get it in the top left corner once. He goes, champions will shoot 50 pucks so that way they never miss. So commitment, make sure, again, use your brain, use your body. Uh, take all the advantage of the free time you get because when you get to be my age, which is I'm spitting dust at this moment, um, you don't get as much free time to enjoy the game as you much. So put, you know, commit to it, brain and body. And uh, again, have a lot of fun. Yep, absolutely. That's going to do it for the Huskies Warming House podcast, episode number 33. What a fun one this was, Nick. Um, we're trying to get our show lengths down. I don't know how well we're doing. Probably not so well, but uh, we're trying not to bore you too much. Um, if I had a mute button, it would dramatically help. 
Yeah, definitely. But uh, you can shut the mute button off right now as we're going to say sayonara to episode number 33 and episode number 34, which will be the golden episode for Mr. Maxson as he just turned 34 last week. Nick, we're going to keep rubbing it in all week long and we'll be back next week. Stay tuned at the den Huskies warming house podcast for Nick Maxson. I'm Noah Grant, blah, 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 blah. Have a wonderful week. Everybody.